dog a selection of stories by various authors story one the glass dog by lyman frank baum an accomplished wizard once lived on the top floor of a tenement house and passed his time in thoughtful study and studious thought what he didn't know about wizardry was hardly worth knowing for he possessed all the books and recipes of all the wizards who had lived before him and moreover he had invented several wizardments himself this admirable person would have been completely happy but for the numerous interruptions to his study caused by folks who came to consult him about their troubles in which he was not interested and by the loud knocks of the iceman the milkman the baker's boy the laundryman and the peanut woman he never dealt with any of these people but they rapped at his door every day to see him about this or that or to try to sell him their wares just when he was most deeply interested in his books or engaged in watching the bubbling of a cauldron there would come a knock at his door and after sending the intruder away he always found he had lost his train of thought or ruined his compound at length these interruptions aroused his anger and he decided he must have a dog to keep people away from his door he didn't know where to find a dog but in the next room lived a poor glass-blower with whom he had a slight acquaintance so he went into the man's apartment and asked where can i find a dog what sort of a dog inquired the glass-blower a good dog one that will bark at people and drive them away one that will be no trouble to keep and won't expect to be fed one that has no fleas and is neat in his habits one that will obey me when i speak to him in short a good dog said the wizard such a dog is hard to find returned the glass blower who was busy making a blue glass flower pot with a pink glass rose bush in it having green glass leaves and yellow glass roses the wizard watched him thoughtfully why cannot you blow me a dog out of glass he asked presently why can declared the glass blower but it would not bark at people you know oh i'll fix that easily enough replied the other if i could not make a glass dog bark i would be a mighty poor wizard oh very well if you can use a glass dog i'll be pleased to blow one for you only you must pay for my work certainly agreed the wizard but i have none of that horrid stuff you call money you must take some of my wares in exchange the glass blower considered the matter for a moment could you give me something to cure my rheumatism he asked oh yes easily then it's a bargain i'll start the dog at once what color of glass shall i use pink is a pretty color said the wizard and it's unusual for a dog isn't it very answered the glass blower but it shall be pink so the wizard went back to his studies and the glass blower began to make the dog next morning he entered the wizard's room with the glass dog under his arm and set it carefully upon the table it was a beautiful pink in color with a fine coat of spun glass and about its neck was twisted a blue glass ribbon its eyes were specks of black glass and sparkled intelligently as do many of the glass eyes worn by men the wizard expressed himself pleased with the glass blower's skill and at once handed him a small vial this will cure your rheumatism he said but the vial is empty protested the glass blower oh no there is one drop of liquid in it was the wizard's reply will one drop cure my rheumatism inquired the glass blower in wonder most certainly that is a marvellous remedy the one drop contained in the vial will cure instantly any kind of disease ever known to humanity therefore it is especially good for rheumatism but guard it well for it is the only drop of its kind in the world and i've forgotten the recipe thank you said the glass blower and went back to his room then the wizard cast a whizzy spell and mumbled several very learned words in the wizardy's language over the glass dog whereupon the little animal first wagged its tail from side to side then winked his left eye knowingly and at last began barking in a most frightful manner that is when you stop to consider the noise came from a pink glass dog there is something almost astonishing in the magic arts of wizards 
unless of course you know how to do the things yourself when you are not expected to be surprised at them the wizard was as delighted as a schoolteacher at the success of his spell although he was not astonished immediately he placed the dog outside his door where it would bark at any one who dared knock and so disturb the studies of his master the glass-blower on returning to his room decided not to use the one drop of wizard cure-all just then my rheumatism is better to-day he reflected and i will be wise to save the medicine for a time when i am very ill when it will be of more service to me so he placed the vial in his cupboard and went to work blowing more roses out of glass presently he happened to think the medicine might not keep so he started to ask the wizard about it but when he reached the door the glass dog barked so fiercely that he dared not knock and returned in great haste to his own room indeed the poor man was quite upset at so unfriendly a reception from the dog he had himself so carefully and skilfully made the next morning as he read his newspaper he noticed an article stating that the beautiful miss midas the richest young lady in town was very ill and the doctors had given up hope of her recovery the glass-blower although miserably poor hard-working and homely of feature was a man of ideas he suddenly recollected his precious medicine and determined to use it to better advantage than relieving his own ills he dressed himself in his best clothes brushed his hair and combed his whiskers washed his hands and tied his necktie blackened his shoes and sponged his vest and then put the vial of magic cure-all in his pocket next he locked his door went downstairs and walked through the streets to the grand mansion where the wealthy miss midas resided the butler opened the door and said no soap no chromos no vegetables no hair oil no books no baking powder my young lady is dying and we're well supplied for the funeral the glass-blower was grieved at being taken for a peddler my friend he began proudly but the butler interrupted him saying no tombstones either there's a family graveyard and the monument's built the graveyard won't need it if you will permit me to speak said the glass-blower no doctor sir they've given up my young lady and she's given up the doctors continued the butler calmly i'm no doctor returned the glass-blower nor are the others but what is your errand i call to cure your young lady by means of a magical compound step in please and take a seat in the hall i'll speak to the housekeeper said the butler more politely so he spoke to the housekeeper and the housekeeper mentioned the matter to the steward and the steward consulted the chef and the chef kissed the lady's maid and sent her to see the stranger thus are the very wealthy hedged around with ceremony even when dying when the lady's maid heard from the glass-blower that he had a medicine which would cure her mistress she said i'm glad you came but said he if i restore your mistress to health she must marry me i'll make inquiries and see if she's willing answered the maid and went at once to consult miss midas the young lady did not hesitate an instant i'd marry any old thing rather than die she cried bring him here at once so the glass-blower came poured the magic drop into a little water gave it to the patient and the next minute miss midas was as well as she had ever been in her life dear me she exclaimed i've an engagement at the fritter's reception to-night bring my pearl-coloured silk marie and i will begin my toilette at once and don't forget to cancel the order for the funeral flowers and your morning gown but miss midas remonstrated the glass-blower who stood by you promised to marry me if i cured you oh, i know said the young lady but we must have time to make proper announcement in the society papers and have the wedding cards engraved call to-morrow and we'll talk it over the glass-blower had not impressed her favourably as a husband and she was glad to find an excuse for getting rid of him for a time and she did not want to miss the fritter's reception yet the man went home filled with joy for he thought his stratagem had succeeded and he was about to marry a rich wife who would keep him in luxury for ever afterward the first thing he did on reaching his room was to smash his glass-blowing tools and throw them out of the window he then sat down to figure out ways of spending his wife's money 
the following day he called upon miss midas who was reading a novel and eating chocolate creams as happily as if she had never been ill in her life where did you get the magic compound that cured me she asked from a learned wizard said he and then thinking it would interest her he told how he had made the glass dog for the wizard and how it barked and kept everybody from bothering him how delightful she said i've always wanted a glass dog that could bark but there's only one in the world he answered and it belongs to the wizard you must buy it for me said the lady the wizard cares nothing for money replied the glass blower then you must steal it for me she retorted i can never live happily another day unless i have a glass dog that can bark the glass blower was much distressed at this but said he would see what he could do for a man should always try to please his wife and miss midas has promised to marry him within a week on his way home he purchased a heavy sack and when he passed the wizard's door and the pink glass dog ran out to bark at him he threw the sack over the dog tied the opening with a piece of twine and carried him away to his own room the next day he sent the sack by a messenger boy to miss midas with his compliments and later in the afternoon he called upon her in person feeling quite sure he would be received with gratitude for stealing the dog she so greatly desired but when he came to the door and the butler opened it what was his amazement to see the glass dog rush out and begin barking at him furiously call off your dog he shouted in terror i can't sir answered the butler my young lady has ordered the glass dog to bark whenever you call here you'd better look out sir he added for if it bites you you may have glassophobia this so frightened the poor glass blower that he went away hurriedly but he stopped at a drug store and put his last dime in the telephone box so he could talk to miss midas without being bitten by the dog give me pelf six seven four two he called hello what is it said a voice i want to speak with miss midas said the glass blower presently a sweet voice said this is miss midas what is it why have you treated me so cruelly and set the glass dog on me asked the poor fellow well to tell the truth said the lady i don't like your looks your cheeks are pale and baggy your hair is coarse and long your eyes are small and red your hands are big and rough and you are bow-legged but i can't help my looks pleaded the glass blower and you really promised to marry me well if you were better looking i'd keep my promise she returned but under the circumstances you are no fit mate for me and unless you keep away from my mansion i will set my glass dog on you then she dropped the phone and would have nothing more to say the miserable glass blower went home with a heart bursting with disappointment and began tying a rope to the bedpost by which to hang himself some one knocked at the door and upon opening it he saw the wizard i've lost my dog he announced have you indeed replied the glass blower tying a knot in the rope yes some one has stolen him oh, that's too bad declared the glass blower indifferently you must make me another said the wizard but i cannot i've thrown away my tools then what shall i do asked the wizard i do not know unless you offer a reward for the dog but i have no money said the wizard offer some of your compounds then suggested the glass blower who was making a noose in the rope for his head to go through the only thing i can spare replied the wizard thoughtfully is a beauty powder what cried the glass blower throwing down the rope have you really such a thing yes indeed whoever takes the powder will become the most beautiful person in the world if you will offer that as a reward said the glass blower eagerly i'll try to find the dog for you for above everything else i long to be beautiful but i warn you the beauty will only be skin deep said the wizard oh that's all right replied the happy glass blower when i lose my skin i shan't care to remain beautiful then tell me where to find my dog and you shall have the powder promised the wizard so the glass blower went out and pretended to search and by and by he returned and said i've discovered the dog you will find him in the mansion of miss midas the wizard went at once to see if this were true and sure enough the glass dog ran out and began barking at him 
then the wizard spread out his hands and chanted a magic spell which sent the dog fast asleep when he picked him up and carried him to his own room on the top floor of the tenement house afterwards he carried the beauty powder to the glass blower as a reward and the fellow immediately swallowed it and became the most beautiful man in the world the next time he called upon miss midas there was no dog to bark at him and when the young lady saw him she fell in love with his beauty at once if only you were a count or a prince she sighed i'd willingly marry you but i am a prince he answered the prince of dog blowers ah said she then if you are willing to accept an allowance of four dollars a week i'll order the wedding cards engraved the man hesitated but when he thought of the rope hanging from his bedpost he consented to the terms so they were married and the bride was very jealous of her husband's beauty and led him a dog's life so he managed to get into debt and made her miserable in turn as for the glass dog the wizard set him barking again by means of his wizardness and put him outside his door i suppose he's there yet and am rather sorry for i should like to consult the wizard about the moral to this story End of story one story two some nonsense about a dog by harry esty Downs my hand will miss the insinuated nose sir william watson but the dog that was written of must have been a big dog nibby was just a comfortable lapful once he had duly turned round and curled up with his nose in his tail this is for people who know about dogs in particular little mongrels without pedigree or market value other people no doubt will find it disgustingly maudlin i would have found it so before nibby came the day he came was a beautiful bright cool one in an august a touring car brought him they put him down on our corner meaning to lose him but he crawled under the car and they had to prod him out and throw stones before they could drive on so that when i came home i found with his mistress-elect a sort of pot-bellied bundle of tarry oakum caked with mud panting convulsively still from fright and showing the whites of uncommonly liquid brown eyes and a pink tongue there was tennis that evening and he went along i carried him over the railroad tracks he gave us no trouble about the balls but lay huddled under the bench where she sat and shivered if a man came near him that night he got chop bones and she got a sensible homily on the unwisdom of feeding strays and he was left outdoors he slept on the mat the second morning we thought he had gone the third he was back wagging approval of us and intent to stay which seemed to leave no choice but to take him in we had fun over names jelly waggles suggested from next door was undeniably descriptive rags fitted or toby or nig but they had a colored maid next door and finally we called him nibs and soon his tail would answer to it cleaned up scrubbed the insoluble matted locks clipped from his coat his trampish collar replaced with a new one bearing a license tag he was far from being unpresentable a vet once opined that for a mongrel he was a good dog that a black cocker mother had thrown her cap over scottish mills so to speak this analysis accounted for him perfectly always depending on the moment's mood he was either terrier or spaniel the snap and scrap and perk of one alternating with the gentle snuggling indolence of the other as a terrier he would dig furiously by the hour after a field mouse as a spaniel he would read the breeze with the best nose among the dog folk of our neighbourhood or follow a trail quite well i know there was retrieving blood a year ago may he caught and brought me not doing the least injury an oriole that probably had flown against a wire and was struggling disabled in the grass nibby was shabby genteel black sunburnt as to the moustache grizzled as to the raggy fringe on his haunches he had a white stock and shirt frill and a white forepaw the brown eyes full of heart were the best point 
His body coat was rough Scottish worsted, the little black pate was cotton soft like shoddy, and the big black ears were genuine spaniel silk. As a terrier, he held them up smartly and carried a plumy fish-hook of a tail. As a spaniel, the ears drooped and the tail swung meekly, as if in apology for never having been clipped. The other day, when we had to say good-bye to him, each of us cut one silky tuft from an ear, very much as we had so often, when he'd been among the burdocks in the field where the garden is. Burrs were by no means Nibby's only failing. In flea time, it seemed hardly possible that a dog of his size could sustain his population. We finally found a true flea bane, but deserted one day. He was populous again the next. They don't relish every human. Me, they did. I used to storm at him for it, and he used, between spasms of scratching, to listen admiringly and wag. We think he supposed his tormentors were winged insects, for he sought refuge in dark clothes closets where a flying imp wouldn't logically come. He was willful, insisted on landing in laps when their makers wanted to read. He would make advances to visitors who were polite about him. He would get up on the living room table, why and how, heaven knows, finding his opportunity when we were out of the house and taking care to be upstairs on a bed, white, grimable coverlets preferred, by the time we had the front door open. I used to slip up to the porch and catch through a window the diving flourish of his sinful tail. One of his faults must have been a neurosis, really. He led a hard life before we took him in, as witnessed the game hind leg that made him sit up side-saddle fashion, and two such scars on his back as boiling hot grease might have made. And something especially cruel had been done to him when asleep, for if you bent over him, napping, or in his bed, he would half rouse and growl, and sometimes snap blindly. We dreaded exuberant visiting children. Two or three experiments, I hate to remember now, convinced me that it couldn't be whipped out of him and once wide awake he was sure to be perplexedly apologetic. He was spoiled. That was our doing. We babied him abominably. He was, for two years, the only subject we had for such malpractice. He had more foolish names than Wog, that dog of Mrs. Stevenson's, and heard more little language than Stella ever did, reciprocating by kissing proffered ears in his doggy way. Once he had brightened up after his arrival, he showed himself ready to take an L whenever we gave an inch, and he was always taking them and never paying penalties. He had conscience enough to be sly. I remember the summer evening we stepped outside for just an instant and came back to find a curious groove across the butter on the dining table and an ever so innocent nibby in a chair in the next room. While we were at the table, he was generally around it, bulldozing for tidbits. I fear he had reason to know that this would work. One fortnight, when his missy was away, he slept on his old man's bed. We had dropped titles of dignity with him by then, and he rang the welkin hourly, answering faraway dog friends, and occasionally came north to lollop my face with tender solicitude, just like the fool nurse in the story, waking the patient up to ask if he was sleeping well. More recently, when a beruffled basket was waiting, he developed an alarming trick of stealing in there to try it, so I fitted that door with a hook, ensuring a crack impervious to dogs and the other night I had to take the hook, now useless, off. We couldn't stand hearing it jingle. He adopted the junior member on first sight and sniff of him, by the way, would look on beaming as proudly as if he'd hatched him. The last of his iniquities arose from a valor that lacked its better part, an absurd mixture of Falstaff and Bantam Rooster. At the critical point, he'd back out of a fuss with a dog of his own size. But let a police dog, an Airedale, a St. Bernard, or a big ugly cur appear, and Nibby was all around him, blackguarding him unendurably. It was lucky that the big dogs in our neighborhood were patient. 
and he never would learn about automobiles usually tried to tackle them head on often stopped cars with merciful drivers when the car wouldn't stop luck would save him by a fraction of an inch i couldn't spank that out of him either we had really been expecting what finally happened for two years that's about all too much i am afraid a decent fate made it quick the other night and clean and close at hand in fact on the same street corner where once a car had left the small scapegrace for us we tell ourselves how glad we are it happened as it did instead of an agonal ending such as many of his people come to we tell ourselves we couldn't have had him for ever in any event that some day for the junior member's sake we shall get another dog we keep telling ourselves these things and talking with animation on other topics the muzzle the leash the drinking dish are hidden the last muddy paw tracks swept up the nose smudges washed off the favorite front window pane but the house is full of a little snoofing wagging loving ghost i know how the boy thoreau felt about a hereafter with dogs barred i want to think that somewhere some time i will be coming home again and that when the door opens nibby will be at hand to caper welcome end of story two story three a yellow dog by bret hart i never knew why in the western states of america a yellow dog should be proverbially considered the acme of canine degradation and incompetency nor why the possession of one should seriously affect the social standing of its possessor but the fact being established i think we accepted it at rattler's ridge without question the matter of ownership was more difficult to settle and although the dog i have in mind at the present writing attached himself impartially and equally to every one in camp no one ventured to exclusively claim him while after the perpetration of any canine atrocity everybody repudiated him with indecent haste well i can swear he hasn't been near our shanty for weeks or the retort he was last seen coming out of your cabin expressed the eagerness with which rattler's ridge watched his hands of any responsibility yet he was by no means a common dog nor even an unhandsome dog and it was a singular fact that his severest critics abide with each other in narrating instances of his sagacity insight and agility which they themselves had witnessed he had been seen crossing the flume that spanned grizzly canyon at a height of nine hundred feet on a plank six inches wide he had tumbled down the chute to the south fork a thousand feet below and was found sitting on the river bank without a scratch save that he was lazily given himself with his off hind paw he had been forgotten in a snowdrift on a sierran shelf and had come home in the early spring with the conceited complacency of an alpine traveller and a plumpness alleged to have been the result of an exclusive diet of buried mail bags and their contents he was generally believed to read the advance election posters and disappear a day or two before the candidates and the brass band which he hated came to the ridge he was suspected of having overlooked colonel johnson's hand at poker and of having conveyed to the colonel's adversary by a succession of barks the danger of betting against four kings while these statements were supplied by wholly unsupported witnesses it was a very human weakness of rattler ridge that the responsibility of cooperation was passed to the dog himself and he was looked upon as a consummate liar snoopin round here and callin yourself a poker sharp are you scoop ya yaller tyson was a common abjuration whenever the unfortunate animal intruded upon a card party ef thar was a spark and adam a truth in that dog i believe my own eyes that i saw him sittin up and tryin to magnetize a jay bird off a tree but what are you goin to do with a yaller equivocator like that i have said that he was yellow or to use the ordinary expression yaller indeed i am inclined to believe that much of the ignominy attached to the epithet lay in this favourite pronunciation men who habitually spoke of a yellow bird a yellow hammer a yellow leaf 
always alluded to him as a yaller dog. He certainly was yellow. After a bath, usually compulsory, he presented a decided gamboge streak down his back from the top of his forehead to the stump of his tail, fading in his sides and flank to a delicate straw color. His breast, legs, and feet when not reddened by slumgullion in which he was fond of wading, were white. A few attempts at ornamental decoration from the India ink pot of the storekeeper failed, uh, partly through the yellow dog's excessive agility, which would never give the paint time to dry on him, and partly through his success in transferring his markings to the trousers and blankets of the camp the size and shape of his tail which had been cut off before his introduction to rattler's ridge were favorite sources of speculation to the miners as determining both his breed and his moral responsibility in coming into camp in that defective condition there was a general opinion that he couldn't have looked worse with a tail and its removal was therefore a gratuitous effrontery his best feature was his eyes, which were a lustrous Van Dyke brown, and sparkling with intelligence. But here again he suffered from evolution through environment, and their original trustful openness was marred by the experience of watching for flying stones, sods, and passing kicks from the rear, so that the pupils were continually reverting to the outer angle of the eyelid nevertheless none of these characteristics decided the vexed question of his breed his speed and scent pointed to a hound and it is related that on one occasion he was laid on the trail of a wildcat with such success that he followed it apparently out of the state returning at the end of two weeks footstore but blandly contented attaching himself to a prospecting party he was sent under the same belief into the brush to drive off a bear who was supposed to be haunting the campfire he returned in a few minutes with the bear driving it into the unarmed circle and scattering the whole party after this the theory of his being a hunting dog was abandoned yet it was said on the usual uncooperated evidence that he had put up a quail and his qualities as a retriever were for a long time accepted until during a shooting expedition for wild ducks it was discovered that the one he had brought back had never been shot and the party were obliged to compound damages with an adjacent settler his fondness for paddling in the ditches and slumgullion at one time suggested a water spaniel he could swim and would occasionally bring out of the river sticks and pieces of bark that had been thrown in but as he always had to be thrown in with them and was a good-sized dog his aquatic reputation faded also he remained simply a yaller dog what more could be said his actual name was bones given to him no doubt through the provincial custom of confounding the occupation of the individual with his quality for which it was pointed out precedents could be found in some old english family names but if bones generally exhibited no preference for any particular individual in camp he always made an exception in favor of drunkards even an ordinary roistering bacchanalian party brought him out from under a tree or a shed in the keenest satisfaction he would accompany them through the long straggling street of the settlement barking his delight at every step or misstep of the revellers and exhibiting none of that mistrust of eye which marked his attendance upon the sane and the respectable he accepted even their uncouth play without a snarl or a yelp hypocritically pretending even to like it and i conscientiously believe would have allowed a tin can to be attached to his tail if the hand that tied it on were only unsteady and the voice that bade him lie still were husky with liquor he would see the party cheerfully into a saloon wait outside the door his tongue fairly lolling from his mouth in enjoyment until they reappeared permit them even to tumble over him with pleasure and then gamble away before them heedless of awkwardly projected stones and epithets 
he would afterward accompany them separately home or lie with them at crossroads until they were assisted to their cabins then he would trot rakishly to his own haunt by the saloon stove with a slightly conscious air of having been a bad dog yet of having had a good time we never could satisfy ourselves whether his enjoyment arose from some merely selfish conviction that he was more secure with the physically and mentally incompetent from some active sympathy with active wickedness or from a grim sense of his own mental superiority at such moments but the general belief lent toward his kindred sympathy as a yowler dog with all that was disreputable and this was supported by another very singular canine manifestation the sincere flattery of simulation or imitation uncle billy riley for a short time enjoyed the position of being the camp drunkard and at once became an object of bone's greatest solicitude he not only accompanied him everywhere curled at his feet or head according to uncle billy's attitude at the moment but it was noticed began presently to undergo a singular alteration in his own habits and appearance from being an active tireless scout and forager a bold and uh, unovertakable marauder he became lazy and apathetic allowed gophers to burrow under him without endeavouring to undermine the settlement in his frantic efforts to dig them out permitted squirrels to flash their tails at him a hundred yards away forgot his usual caches and left his favourite bones unburied and bleaching in the sun his eyes grew dull his coat lustreless in proportion as his companion became blear-eyed and ragged in running his usual arrow-like directness began to deviate and it was not unusual to meet the pair together zigzagging up the hill indeed uncle billy's condition could be predetermined by bones's appearance at times when his temporary master was invisible the old man must have an awful jag on to-day was usually remarked when an extra fluffiness and imbecility was noticeable in the passing bones at first it was believed that he drank also but when careful investigation proved this hypothesis untenable he was freely called a derned time-servin' yaller hypocrite not a few advanced the opinion that if bones had not actually led uncle billy astray he at least slavered him over and coddled him until the old man got conceited in his wickedness this undoubtedly led to a compulsory divorce between them and uncle billy was happily dispatched to a neighbouring town and a doctor bones it seemed to miss him greatly ran away for two days and was supposed to have visited him to have been shocked at his convalescence and to have been cut by uncle billy in his reformed character and he returned to his old active life again and buried his past with his forgotten bones it was said that he was afterward detected in trying to lead an intoxicated tramp into camp after the methods employed by a blind man's dog but was discovered in time by the of course uncooperated narrator i should be tempted to leave him thus in his original and picturesque sin but the same veracity which compelled me to transcribe his faults and iniquities obliges me to describe his ultimate and somewhat monotonous reformation which came from no fault of his own it was a joyous day at rattler's ridge that was equally the advent of his change of heart and the first stagecoach that had been induced to diverge from the high road and stop regularly at our settlement flags were flying from the post office and polka saloon and bones was flying before the brass band that he detested when the sweetest girl in the county pinky preston daughter of the county judge and hopelessly beloved by all rattlers ridge stepped from the coach which she had glorified by occupying as an invited guest what makes him run away she asked quickly opening her lovely eyes in a possibly innocent wonder that anything could be found to run away from her he don't like the brass band we explained eagerly how funny murmured the girl is it out of tune as all that this irresistible witticism alone would have been enough to satisfy us we did nothing but repeat it to each other all the next day 
but we were positively transported when we saw her suddenly gather her dainty skirts in one hand and trip off through the red dust toward bones who with his eyes over his yellow shoulder had halted in the road and half turned in mingled disgust and rage at the spectacle of the descending trombone we held our breath as she approached him would bones evade her as he did us at such moments or would he save our reputation and consent for the moment to accept her as a new kind of inebriate she came nearer he saw her he began to slowly quiver with excitement his stump of a tail vibrating with such rapidity that the loss of the missing portion was scarcely noticeable suddenly she stopped before him took his yellow head between her little hands lifted it and looked down in his handsome brown eyes with her two lovely blue ones what passed between them in that magnetic glance no one ever knew she returned with him said to him casually we're not afraid of brass bands are we to which he apparently acquiesced at least stifling his disgust of them while he was near her which was nearly all the time during the speech-making her gloved hand and his yellow head were always near each other and at the crowning ceremony her public checking of yuba bill's waybill on behalf of the township with a gold pencil presented to her by the stage company bones's joy far from knowing no bounds seemed to know nothing but them and he witnessed it apparently in the air no one dared to interfere for the first time a local pride in bones sprang up in our hearts and we lied to each other in his praises openly and shamelessly then the time came for parting we were standing by the door of the coach hats in hand as miss pinky was about to step into it bones was waiting by her side confidently looking into the interior and apparently selecting his own seat on the lap of judge preston in the corner when miss pinky held up the sweetest of admonitory fingers then taking his head between her two hands she again looked into his brimming eyes and said simply good dog with the gentlest of emphasis on the adjective and popped into the coach the six bay horses started as one the gorgeous green and gold vehicle bounded forward the red dust rose behind and the yellow dog danced in and out of it to the very outskirts of the settlement and then he soberly returned a day or two later he was missed but the fact was afterward known that he was at spring valley the county town where miss preston lived and he was forgiven a week afterward he was missed again but this time for a longer period and then a pathetic letter arrived from sacramento for the storekeeper's wife would you mind wrote miss pinky preston asking some of your boys to come over here to sacramento and bring back bones i don't mind having the dear dog walk out with me at spring valley where everybody knows me but here he does make one so noticeable on account of his color i've got scarcely a frock that he agrees with he don't go with my pink muslin and that lovely buff tint he makes three shades lighter you know yellow is so trying a consultation was quickly held by the whole settlement and a deputation sent to sacramento to relieve the unfortunate girl we were all quite indignant with bones but oddly enough i think it was greatly tempered with our new pride in him while he was with us alone his peculiarities had been scarcely appreciated but the recurrent phrase that yellow dog that they keep at the rattlers gave us a mysterious importance along the countryside as if we had secured a mascot in some zoological curiosity this was further indicated by a singular occurrence a new church had been built at the crossroads and an eminent divine had come from san francisco to preach the opening sermon after a careful examination of the camp's wardrobe and some felicitous exchange of apparel a few of us were deputed to represent rattlers at the sunday service in our white ducks straw hats and flannel blouses we were sufficiently picturesque and distinctive as honest miners to be shown off in one of the front pews 
seated near the prettiest girls who offered us their hymn books in the cleanly odor of fresh pine shavings and ironed muslin and blown over by the spices of our own woods through the open windows a deep sense of the abiding peace of christian communion settled upon us at this supreme moment someone murmured in an awe-stricken whisper will you look at bones we looked bones had entered the church and gone up in the gallery through a pardonable ignorance and modesty but perceiving his mistake was now calmly walking along the gallery rail before the astounded worshippers reaching the end he paused for a moment and carelessly looked down it was about fifteen feet to the floor below the simplest jump in the world for the mountain-bred bones daintily gingerly lazily and yet with a conceited airiness of manner as if humanly speaking he had one leg in his pocket and were doing it on three he cleared the distance dropping just in front of the chancel without a sound turned himself around three times and then lay comfortably down three deacons were instantly in the aisle coming up before the eminent divine who we fancied wore a restrained smile we heard the hurried whispers belongs to them quite a local institution here you know don't like to offend sensibilities and the ministers prompt by no means as he went on with his service a short month ago we would have repudiated bones to-day we sat there in slightly supercilious attitudes as if to indicate that any affront offered to bones would be an insult to ourselves and followed by our instantaneous withdrawal in a body all went well however until the minister lifting the large bible from the communion table and holding it in both hands before him walked toward a reading stand by the altar rails bones uttered a distinct growl the minister stopped we and we alone comprehended in a flash the whole situation the bible was nearly the size and shape of one of those soft clods of sod which we were in the playful habit of launching at bones when he lay half asleep in the sun in order to see him cleverly evade it we held our breath what was to be done but the opportunity belonged to our leader jeff briggs a confoundedly good-looking fellow with the golden moustache of a northern viking and the curls of an apollo secure in his beauty and bland in his self-conceit he rose from the pew and stepped before the chancel rails i would wait a minute if i were you sir he said respectfully and you will see that he will go out quietly what is wrong whispered the minister in some concern he thinks you are going to heave that book at him sir without giving him a fair show as we do the minister looked perplexed but remained motionless with the book in his hands bones arose walked halfway down the aisle and vanished like a yellow flash with this justification of his reputation bones disappeared for a week at the end of that time we received a polite note from judge preston saying that the dog had become quite domiciled in their house and begged that the camp without yielding up their valuable property in him would allow him to remain at spring valley for an indefinite time that both the judge and his daughter with whom bones was already an old friend would be glad if the members of the camp would visit their old favorite whenever they desired to assure themselves that he was well cared for i am afraid that the bait thus ingenuously thrown out had a good deal to do with our ultimate yielding however the reports of those who visited bones were wonderful and marvelous he was residing there in state lying on rugs in the drawing-room coiled up under the judicial desk in the judge's study sleeping regularly on the mat outside miss pinky's bedroom door or lazily snapping at flies on the judge's lawn he's as yaller as ever said one of our informants but it don't somehow seem to be the same back that we used to break clods over in the old time just to see him scoot out of the dust and now i must record a fact which i am aware all lovers of dogs will indignantly deny and which will be furiously bayed at by every faithful hound since the days of ulysses bones not only forgot but absolutely cut us 
those who called upon the judge in store clothes he would perhaps casually notice but he would sniff at them as if detecting and resenting them under their superficial exterior the rest he simply paid no attention to the more familiar term of bonesy formerly applied to him as in our rare moments of endearment produced no response this pained i think some of the more youthful of us but through some strange human weakness it also increased the camp's respect for him nevertheless we spoke of him familiarly to strangers at the very moment he ignored us i am afraid that we also took some pains to point out that he was getting fat and unwieldy and losing his elasticity implying covertly that his choice was a mistake and his life a failure a year after he died in the odor of sanctity and respectability being found one morning coiled up stiff on the mat outside miss pinky's door when the news was conveyed to us we asked permission the camp being in a prosperous condition to erect a stone over his grave but when it came to the inscription we could only think of the two words murmured to him by miss pinky which we always believe effected his conversion good dog end of story three story four grist by murray leinster one he threw back his head and howled eerily his muzzle lifted to the stars and the most mournful sound known to man poured from his throat and was echoed and re-echoed by the hooded cedars and the rocks about him he could not have told you why he howled dogs are not prone to introspection but he knew that his master who should be in the cabin yonder would never come out again he knew that the dying wisps of smoke from the chimney would never billow out in thick gray clouds again and he knew that the other man who had come out so hastily and gone swinging down the river trail would never never return chichico was chained it had originally been a mark of disgrace an unbearable humiliation to a malamute pup but he did not mind it any longer his master had made sleeping quarters for him that were vastly warmer than a snow bed even in the coldest weather and chichico wholeheartedly approved he was comfortable he was fed and carson released him now and then to stretch his legs and swore at him affectionately from time to time and no reasonable dog will demand any more or so chichico viewed it anyhow but now his muzzle tilted up his eyes half closed and from his throat those desolate and despairing howls poured forth ow you ow you they were a dirge and a lament they were sounds of grief and they were noises of despair chichico could not explain their meaning at all but when a man dies they spring full-bodied from that man's dog's throat the hooded cedars watched and echoed back the sound the rocks about him watched and gave tongue stilly in a faint reflection of his sorrow the river listened and babbled absently of sympathy and rippled on the river has seen too many men die to be disturbed the wilds listened for many miles around the despairing grief-stricken howling reached to tree and forest and hill and valley the thin and muted wailing bore its message only the cabin seemed indifferent though the tragedy was within it somewhere within the four log walls carson lay sprawled out chichico knew that he was dead without knowing how he knew there had been a shot later the other man had come out hastily with a pack on his back he had taken the river trail and disappeared and long into the night until the pale moonlight faded and died chichico howled his sorrow for a thing he did not understand of his own predicament the dog had yet no knowledge it was natural to be chained food was brought when one was chained that there was now no one to bring him food that no one was likely to come and that the most pertinacious of puppy teeth could not work through the chain that bound him these things did not disturb him his head thrown back his eyes half closed he howled in an ecstasy of grief 
and while he gave vent to his sorrow in the immemorial tradition of his race a faint rumbling set up afar off in the wilds it was hardly more than a murmur and maybe it was the wind among the trees maybe it was a minor landslide in the hills not so many miles away a few hundred tons of earth and stone that plunged downward when the thaw of spring released its keystone maybe it was any one of any number of things even a giant spruce tree crashing thunderously to the ground but it lasted a little too long for any such simple explanation if one were inclined to be fanciful one would say it was the mill of one of the forest gods grinding the grist of men's destinies and set going now by the murder of which chichaco howled certainly many unrelated things began to happen which bore obscurely upon that killing the man who had fled down river reflected on his cleverness and grinned to himself he opened thick sausage-like bags and ran his fingers through shining yellow dust remembering his security against detection or punishment he laughed cacklingly and very far away away down in seattle bob holliday found courage to ask a girl to marry him and promised to go back to alaska only long enough to gather together what capital he had accumulated when they would be married most of what he owned he told her was in a placer claim that he and sam carson worked together he would sell out to sam and return but he could not take her back to the hardships he had endured he was filled with a fierce desire to shield and protect her that meant money outside of course and he started north eagerly for the results of many years suffering and work which sam carson was guarding for him and again in a dingy small building a sleepy mail clerk discovered a letter that had slipped behind account books and been hidden for months on end he cancelled its stamp and dropped it into a mail bag to go to its proper destination then the rumbling murmur which might have been the mill of a forest god off in the wilds stopped abruptly the grist had had its first grinding but the mill was not put away oh no chichaco howled on until the moonlight paled and day came again and the letter that had lain so long was dropped into a canoe and floated down to the coast in charge of a half-breed paddleman and bob holliday sped north for alaska and his partner sam carson who guarded a small fortune that holliday had earned in sweat and agony and fierce battle with the wilds and winter snows holliday was very happy the money his partner held for him would mean comforts and even luxuries for the girl he loved the mill of the forest god was simply laid aside for a little while they grind not slowly these mills of the gods but very swiftly more swiftly than the grist can come to their grinding stones now and then they are forced to wait for more but everything upon the earth comes to them some time high ambitions and most base desires and women's laughter and red blood gushing and all hopes and fears and lusts and terrors together disappear between the millstones and come out transformed into the product that the gods desire the mill was merely waiting two the place had the indefinable air of desertion that comes upon a wilderness cabin in such an amazingly short time the woodpile huge yet clearly but the remnant of a winter supply had not yet sprouted any of the mosses and lichens that multiply on dead wood in the short alaskan summer the axe even was leaned against the door chips still rested on blades of the quickly growing grass that comes before the snow has vanished a pipe rested on a bench before the house but the place was deserted the feel of emptiness was in the air holliday had drawn in his breath for a shout to announce his coming when the curious desolation all about struck home it was almost like a blow every sign and symbol of occupancy every possible indication that the place was what it seemed to be the winter quarters of an old-timer thriftily remaining near his claim and then suddenly the feeling of emptiness that was like death he disembarked in silence his forehead creased in a quick and puzzled frown 
He was walking swiftly when he climbed the bluff, glancing sharply here and there. A sudden cold apprehension made him hesitate. Then he shook himself impatiently and moved more quickly still. Within ten yards of the door, he stopped stock still, and then he fairly rushed for the cabin and plunged within. It was a long time later that he came out. He was very pale and looked like a man who had been shaken to the core. He was swearing brokenly, and then he made himself stop and sit down. With shaking fingers, he filled his pipe and lighted it. In his bunk, he said evenly to the universe, a bullet through his head. No sign of a fight. It is incredible, but there isn't a sign of any dust or any supplies, and somebody else had been bunking in there with him. Murder, of course. He smoked. Presently he got up and found a path which he followed. At its end he saw what he was looking for. He poked about the cradle there, and expertly fingered the heap of gravel that had been thawed and dug out to be washed when summer came again. He'd cleaned up, he said evenly. He must have had a lot of dust, and the man with him knew it. I've got to find that man. His hands clenched and unclenched as he went back towards the cabin, and then he calmed himself again. His eyes searched for a suitable spot for the thing he had to do. And then, quite suddenly, My God! said Holliday. It was Chichaco, who had dragged himself to the limit of his chain, and with his last atom of strength, managed to whimper faintly. Chichaco was not pretty to look at. It had been a very long time since the night that he howled to the stars of his grief for the man who was dead, and he had been chained fast. Chichaco was alive, and that was all. He lay on the ground, looking up with agonized, pitiful eyes. Holliday stared down at him and reached for his gun in sheer mercy. Then his eyes hardened. No, I guess not. You'll be Sam's dog. You'll have to stay alive a while yet. Maybe you can pick out his murderer for me. He unbuckled the collar that Chichaco's most frenzied efforts had not enabled him to reach, and took the mass of skin and boniness beneath down toward his canoe. With a face like stone, he tended Chichaco with infinite gentleness. And that night he left Chichaco wrapped up in his own blankets while he carved deeply upon a crudely fashioned wooden cross. His expression frightened Chichaco a little, but the dog lay huddled in the blankets and gazed at him hungrily. Chichaco hoped desperately that this man would be his master hereafter. Only he also hoped desperately that he would never, never use a chain. 3. Chichaco learned much and forgot a little in the weeks that followed. When he could stand on his wobbling paws, Holiday took him off invalid's diet and fed him more naturally canine dishes, the perpetual dried or frozen fish of the dog teams, for instance. Chichaco wolfed it as he wolfed everything else, and in that connection learned a lesson. Once in his eagerness, he leaped up to snatch it from Holiday's hand. His snapping teeth closed on empty air, and he was soundly thrashed for the effort. Later, he learned not to snarl or snap if his food was taken squarely from between his teeth. When he had mastered that, he was tamed. He understood that he was not to try to bite Holiday under any circumstances whatever. And when he had mastered the idea, he was almost pitifully anxious to prove his loyalty to Holiday. The only thing was that in learning that, he got it into his head that he was not to snarl at or try to sink his teeth in any man. That was possibly why Holiday was disappointed when he took the dog grimly downstream and made his inquiries as to who had come down in the two weeks after Carson's murder. He found the names of every arrival, and he grimly pursued every one who might have been the man he was looking for. Each one had a plausible tale to tell. Most of them were known and could prove their whereabouts at the time of Carson's death. But enough had trapped or wintered inland near their claims to make the absence of any explanation at all no proof of guilt. That was where Chichaco was to come in. Always, before his grim interrogation was over, Holiday unobtrusively allowed Chichaco to draw near. 
Chichaco had known the man who had been with Carson when he was murdered. Holliday watched him closely. He would sniff at the man, glance up at his master, and wag his tail placatingly. Holliday watched for some sign of recognition. Chichaco grew to consider it a part of the greeting of every man his master met. That was the difference between them. Chichaco simply did not understand. He had already forgotten a great deal of what had happened to him, and Holliday was his master now. Carson was a dim and misty figure of the past. By the time Holliday actually came upon the man of whom he was in search, Chichaco considered the little ceremony a part of the scheme of things not to be deviated from. They found him camping alone, after trailing him for two days. Howdy, said he, looking up from his fire with its sizzling pan of beans and bacon. Howdy, said Holliday curtly, you came down river about a month ago. The man bent forward over his fire. Chichaco, watching patiently, saw his whole figure stiffen. I'll come down, yes, said the camper, stirring his beans. Sweat came out on his forehead, but he made no movement toward a weapon. He was not the sort to fight anything out. No, Sam Carson? demanded Holliday. Mm, said the camper. Seems like I knew him once in Nome. His eyes rested on Chichaco and flicked away. Chichaco knew that he was recognized, and he wagged his tail tentatively, but he had changed allegiance now. He waited to see what Holliday would do. Stop at his cabin, demanded Holliday grimly. Nope, said the camper. What's up? Pup, said Holliday. This was Chichaco's cue. Holliday did not know what Carson had called him, and Pup had been a substitute. Knowing then what Holliday expected of him, and anxious to do nothing of which his master would not approve, Chichaco went forward and sniffed politely at the man's leg. He rather expected some sign of recognition. When it came, Chichaco would respond as cordially as was consonant in a dog who belonged to someone else. But the man who had stayed with Carson made no move whatever, though his smell to Chichaco was the smell of a thing in deadly fear. Chichaco glanced up at Holliday and wagged his tail placatingly. He don't seem to know you, said Holliday grimly. I guess you didn't. They camped with the stranger then, and he told Holliday that his name was Dugan and that he was a placer man and had stories at which Holliday unbent enough to smile faintly. Holliday was grim and silent these days because he had a manhunt on his hands, and the gold dust that was to have made a certain girl happy had been stolen by the murderer of his friend. He listened abstractedly to Dugan's jest, but mostly he brooded over the death of his friend and his own hopes in the same instant. Chichaco lay at the edge of the circle of firelight and watched the two men. Mostly he watched Holliday, because Holliday was his master, but often his eyes dwelt puzzledly on Dugan. He knew Dugan, and Dugan knew him. Vaguely a dim remembrance arose of Dugan in Carson's cabin, feeding him a sweet and pleasant-tasting liquid out of a bottle while he laughed uproariously. Yes, Chichaco remembered it distinctly. He wondered if Dugan had any more of that pleasant stuff. Once he rose and started forward tentatively. Dugan had been smelling quite normally human, but as Chichaco drew near him, he again smelled like something that is afraid. It puzzled Chichaco. He sniffed and would have gone nearer, but first, of course, he looked at Holliday. And Holliday merely glanced at him and did not notice. Chichaco was used to such ignoring. He wagged his tail a little and went back outside the firelight. His master did not want him near. But later that night, when the two men lay rolled in their blankets in the smoke of the smudge fire, Chichaco went thoughtfully forward again. He began to nudge Dugan's kit with his nose. There might be some of that sweet-tasting liquid. Holliday awoke and sat up with a start. The other man had not gone to sleep. "'What the hell's your dog doing in my kit?' he demanded hysterically. "'We'll see,' said Holliday." His voice had a curious edge to it. Chichaco sniffed about. There was something there that had a familiar odor. He drew in his breath in a long and luxurious smell. Then he began to scratch busily. "'I'll take a look at that,' said Holliday grimly. 
He went to where Chichaco scratched, while Dugan moved cautiously among his blankets. The firelight glinted momentarily on polished metal among the coverings. The metal thing was pointed at Holliday's back, though it trembled slightly. Holliday looked up. "'You're bacon,' he said, his tone altered. "'Get out,' he ordered Chichaco. Chichaco went away after wagging his tail placatingly. Presently he curled up and slept fitfully, the odor he had sniffed permeating all his dreams. The odor was that of Carson, and Chichaco dreamed of times in the cabin when Dugan was there. Holiday, too, composed himself to slumber, but Dugan lay awake and shivered. Some of Carson's possessions were in the kit Chichaco had nosed at, and though he had had his revolver on holiday, Dugan was by no means sure he could have summoned the nerve to kill him. He had killed Carson in a fashion peculiarly his own, which did not require that he discharge the weapon himself. But now he debated in a panicky fear if he had not better shoot holiday sleeping. It would be dangerous down here not like the hills at all but it might be best if that damned dog kept sniffing round the next morning he cursed in a species of hysterical relief when he saw chichaco trotting soberly away behind his master chichaco wagged his tail politely in parting he did not understand why dugan had feigned not to remember him now they were going to find another man and holiday would expect him to sniff that man's legs and look up and wag his tail. It was a ceremony that was part of the scheme of things. Chichaco simply remembered Dugan as a man who had stayed a long time with Carson in the cabin up river and had fed him sweet liquid out of a bottle, and now smelled as if he were afraid. But Holiday, of course, did not know that. Otherwise he would have been burying Dugan by this time, with a grimly satisfied look upon his face. For Far off in the wilderness, where the cedars meditated beside a deserted cabin, a faint rumbling murmur set up again. Of course, it might have been the wind in the trees, or a minor landslide in the hills not many miles away, or even a giant spruce tree crashing thunderously to the earth. But it lasted just a bit too long for such a simple explanation. To a fanciful hearer, it might have sounded as if the mill of the forest god were grinding its grist again and just as such an idea would demand, many unrelated things began to happen which bore obscurely upon the murder of a man now buried deeply beneath a deeply carved wooden cross. Holiday, for instance, received two letters. One was from the girl who loved him. One was from the dead man, stained and draggled with long journeying and much forwarding and months on its travels. The letter from the girl told him pitifully that she loved him and wanted to be near him and offered to come and share any trial or hardship rather than endure the numbing pain of separation. Holiday, of course, knew better than to take her at her word. The other letter was very short. Dear Bob, I'm sending this down by Chillicote's buck that stopped to ask for some matches. The claim is proving up kind of a bonanza, because I already took out near twenty thousand in dust, which makes a damn big poke for you with what you got me to keep for you. You better look out or I'll steal it. Aha! I got me a new dog that I called Chichaco. He's a pretty good dog, and I got a feller to help me out until you come back, and he's taught the pup to drink molasses out of a bottle. You ought to see it. Well, no more until next time. Yours, Sam. And the man, who had come down the river trail and left Chichaco chained to starve these many long moons past, he found himself growing short of cash and lacking an easier way to recoup his fortunes, decided to do some placer work himself. When he worked with Sam Carson, he had marked down a likely spot, but did not trouble to work it because he could attain to wealth so much more simply, just a bullet that he need not even fire himself. He took canoe and went paddling up the river, having a winter supply bundled up in the bow. Then the mill stopped again, and again, for lack of grist to grind, doubtless the forest god to whom it belonged went on about his other affairs. 5. 
Chichaco slept within the cabin that winter, stretched out before the fire and soaking the heat into his body with a luxurious enjoyment that only a dog can compass. There was no need for the discipline that before had made his chaining necessary. Holiday training had had better results than Carson's. Chichaco was a well-mannered dog now, who listened soberly when Holiday talked to him. And Holiday talked often loneliness in the wilds is quite different from loneliness anywhere else with the snow piled in monster drifts about the cabin so that there was an actual tunnel a good part of the way from the door to the woodpile he was utterly isolated from the world he had to talk he told chichaco confidentially just what the girl outside meant to him he would not have said it to any living man but the dog listened soberly Sometimes Holiday grew morose, sometimes he called himself a fool for not bringing her with him, and then gave thanks that he did not. And he had moments of passionate jealousy and doubt, wondering if she were waiting for him and believing in him through all the months when no word from either could reach the other. He read her last letter into tiny fragments. Long after, he could recite it word for word. He read strange meanings into it, as that she began to feel her loyalty wavering and in honesty wished to place it beyond recall and then he read them out again and was bitterly ashamed that such things had entered his mind at all all this was during the days of storm when he could not even build monster fires and thaw out gravel to be shifted where the first waters of spring would wash out its infinitesimal proportion of gold for him but Dugan appeared at the cabin in December. He came on snowshoes and had conquered his first surprise before he shouted outside the cabin door. Dugan had come over in hopes of finding some stray reading matter, anything to break the monotony of his own cabin some four miles or more away. The smoke warned him that someone was within, and no more than a flicker of his eyelids expressed surprise that Holiday was the occupant. Holiday greeted him with a feverish cordiality, pressed tobacco upon him, bade him remain and eat, presented Chichaco, and they talked interminably. Dugan was jollity itself. He was soon assured that Holiday had no suspicion of him. He had left no clue after the murder, and Chichaco, who might have gambled about him, had been trained by Holiday into the perfection of canine manners. Chichaco remembered, yes, but he did not associate Dugan with the death of his former master. And in any event, he was a dog, and there was but one master in the world for him. Injuries done to a past owner would not arouse Chichaco now, though he would fight to the last drop of his blood for holiday. Dugan had every reason in the world to feel secure. He was secure. In his gratitude for having someone to talk to, Holiday would have welcomed the devil himself. When Dugan finally left for his own cabin, Holiday was more nearly normal than for months. And it may be that Dugan's presence kept Holiday sane that winter. He was surely used to loneliness, but no such loneliness as possessed him now. No man is lonely who can keep his brain busy with the things of the moment and the place he is in, but Holiday could not do that. A picture of the girl who waited for him was always at hand. His presence and his desperate work was due to her. He could not help thinking and dreaming of her, and that thinking and dreaming made the solitude into a corroding horror. Dugan changed all that. He was someone to talk to. Holiday even told him about the girl. He talked for hours about her, while Chichaco lay at one side of the cabin floor and watched gravely, his ears alert and his eyes somber. Often he watched Dugan, and vague memories crept disturbingly about his mind. Here, in this same cabin... Dugan knew about the murder, too, how Holiday had come joyously to the cabin and found his best friend murdered and his happiness destroyed in the one instant. Sam Carson had been the keeper of most of Holiday's possessions, and they had been stolen by the murderer. It was probably his own feigned sympathy and secret sardonic amusement that suggested a duplication of his former feat to Dugan. Dugan's own claim was rich. 
how rich he could not tell until spring but holiday's claim was little worse carson had skimmed the cream but the rest was worth taking if it could be done without risk and dugan who had not nerve enough to shoot a man in cold blood but was too cowardly to pick a fight grinned obscurely to himself he fingered his own pokes which would be bulging when spring came he thought of holidays and then he began to whittle out a little contrivance of wood and leather and thongs which looked very much like a trap but was much more deadly it was a clever idea of his own perfectly safe and absolutely no risk suddenly he stooped and listened it seemed as if some noise to which his ears were unconsciously attuned had suddenly ceased maybe the mill had stopped again six and then spring came from the trees came cracklings as their coatings of sleet and solidified snow were stripped off and fell melting to the earth below from the river came minor rumblings as the thawed streams of the mountains poured their waters into it and its surface ice grown thinner cracked across and spun downstream in crumbling ice pans toward the sea the rocks from hooded things in dazzling cerements peered out naked and glistening like newborn seals at the world that was stirring for its feverish growth of summer the spruce buds swelled to bursting slowly dwindling patches of snow disclosed incongruously green grass prematurely sprouted and the wild things seemed to wake bull caribou roared their challenges in the indefinite distance foxes moved about keen and joyously savage no longer hampered by the snow now and then the winter's wind drift above some hidden hollow stirred and a peevish bear emerged from his long sleep sleepily ferocious and holiday worked like a madman all day long he shoveled his gravel and dirt into the cradle through which a small stream ran after the first few days he sang it might be that he would not have a sum that would satisfy him but he would squander some of it and see the girl who loved him he would see her and speak to her again it was no wonder that he sang and dugan he worked too and his eyes glistened at the size of his clean-ups he filled one poke then another and still another as time went on but dugan would never be satisfied with what was his own he went over to holiday's cabin now and then and listened while holiday told him excitedly of the miracle that would happen he was going outside in a little while longer he would see the girl he told the whole course of his progress to the man who had murdered his friend while chichaco sat between his feet and regarded dugan speculatively chichaco could not understand why dugan so consistently ignored him it seemed illogical to the dog because he remembered that in the same cabin and at last holiday came back from the cradle singing at the top of his voice chichaco had caught some of his festive spirit and danced clumsily about him dugan was sitting on the bench before the cabin and his eyelids flickered when holiday came into view i'm through shouted holiday at sight of his visitors dugan i'm through i'm going down river in the morning with a fat poke in my pack to see the most wonderful girl in the world dugan grinned he had been at the cabin for some little time and there was a surprise he had prepared for holiday inside it was the same surprise he had prepared for carson oh, i'm going down to-morrow myself he said close up my shack and quit my workings we'll celebrate said holiday exuberantly man i'm going outside to the most wonderful chichaco sniffed the air in the cabin dugan did not smell normally human he smelled as if he were afraid and yet he was grinning and cracking jokes as if he shared in holiday's uproarious happiness chichaco continued to be puzzled and to grow more puzzled two or three times he cocked up his ears as if listening to a faint rumbling murmur far off in the wilds which might have been anything even the mill of a forest god grinding the grist of men's destinies but mostly he watched the two men 
Dugan produced a bottle, long hoarded, but Holliday would not touch it. He wanted to stay awake, he said, that no atom of his wonderful good luck should go untasted to the full. He would be starting downstream at daybreak, and Dugan grinned and drank himself. Holliday began to cook a festive meal. The smells were savory and delicious, but Chichaco's nose suddenly attracted him to an unusual spot. He went tentatively toward Holliday's bunk. Being a well-mannered dog, he knew he should never climb upon his master's bed, but something drew him there irresistibly. He sniffed, and Dugan's smell was suddenly that of a thing in deadly fear. Chichaco turned his head and regarded him puzzledly. Dugan's scent was on his master's blankets, too, and Dugan had no business to be there. Chichaco sniffed, bewildered. This other odor. There's just one thing, said Holliday, with a sudden wistful gravity. Old Sam's dead. I told you how he was murdered. I wish, well, I wish he was going outside with me. The faint rumbling outside that sounded like millstones grinding grew suddenly loud and harsh, as if the stones were rumbling up the last stray grains that had been fed to them. Chichaco cocked his ears, but that was only a noise. There was a queer smell on his master's bunk. He heaved up his forepaws to sniff it more nearly. Chichaco snapped Dugan. Dugan had gone suddenly pale, and more than ever he had the smell of fear upon him. Holliday lifted his head, and a curious expression came upon his face. Dugan went over and took Chichaco by the collar. "'Shedding fleas on your bunk,' he said to Holliday, grinning. "'But he ought to share in the celebration, too. Got any molasses?' He knew, of course. He reached up and took down the bottle of syrup Holliday had saved as a supreme luxury. "'Taught a dog to do this once,' grinned Dugan. "'Here, you, Chichaco, open your mouth.' Chichaco sniffed at his leg. Then he saw the bottle. His eyes danced. Dugan had remembered at last. He jumped up to lick eagerly. "'Oh!' roared Dugan as Chichaco struggled frantically to coax out the sticky, sweet stuff faster than it would flow. "'I knew you'd like it. Watch him, Holliday!' Holliday straightened up. "'You've never heard me call that dog Chichaco,' he said queerly. "'I've always called him Pup. The only other man who'd know his name would be Sam Carson and—' Holliday's voice changed swiftly. "'And the man who killed him. And that trick—' "'By God, you're Sam Carson's murderer!' His revolver flashed out. Dugan gasped. The bottle fell to the floor, and Chichaco lapped eagerly at its exuding contents. "'You shot him from behind,' said Holliday savagely, "'with your gun not a foot from his head. "'Get that gun out now, Dugan. I give you just two seconds.' Dugan's teeth chattered. His eyes darted despairingly to the bunk. Holliday's face was like stone. There was no faintest trace of mercy in it. With a sudden squeal like that of a cornered rat, Dugan rushed for him. And Holliday's revolver was out and in his hand, but Dugan's open-handed attack brought an instinctive response in kind. His free fist shot out in a terrific blow. It caught Dugan squarely between the eyes and hurled him backward. He staggered, and his foot crushed Chichaco's paw. The dog leaped up with a yelp and bared teeth, and his movement was enough to upset Dugan's balance completely. He toppled backward, and a sudden terrible scream filled all the cabin. He fell against the bunk, and his arms clutched wildly, while his face showed only frozen horror. Then he crashed down on the blankets, and there was a bellowing roar and a burst of smoke from the bunk. Dugan did not even shudder. He lay quite still. Presently, a sullen little drip, drip, drip sounded on the floor. Holliday bent over and pawed among the blankets. He brought out a curious little contrivance, very much like a trap. It was a board with a revolver tied to it, and a thong so arranged that pressure on the thong would discharge the revolver into the source of the pressure. Chichaco sniffed at it. It was the source of the peculiar odor he had noticed in his master's bunk. He wagged his tail placatingly and looked up at Holliday. "'Right where my head would have been,' said Holliday, shuddering a little in spite of himself, when I lay down to sleep. He was going to stay here overnight. 
I see how he killed Carson now. Ah! Sick with disgust and a little shaken, he flung down the board. Holiday did not go down river at daybreak. It was nearer noon when he started, and instead of one deeply carved cross in the ground about the cabin, there were two. One read, Sam Carson murdered June 2, 19 blank, and the other, his murderer, June 2, 19 blank. Holiday paddled down the river with Chichaco in the bow of his canoe, looking with bright and curious eyes at all that was to be seen. Holiday had the gold that he had washed out himself during the winter. He had, besides, gold taken from Dugan's pokes to the amount that Dugan had stolen. The surplus he had scattered in the river. He did not want it. He was going outside to the girl who had waited for him. And the mill? Oh, the mill had ground up all its grist. It stopped until one day a half-breed killed a white man in some dispute over an Indian woman, and the echo of the shot traveled thinly over the wilds, and then a faint rumbling murmur set up, which might, of course, have been the wind in the trees, or a landslide in the hills not so very far away, but equally, of course, it might not. End of Story 4 Story 5 what kind of a dog? by Christopher Morley. Well, what kind of a dog is he? said the Seacliff veterinary over the phone. We must confess we were stumped. All we could say was that he is, well, just a kind of a dog. We didn't like to say that he is a synthetic hound and that his full name is Haphazard Gissing One. We didn't like to admit, at any rate, over the telephone, that one of his grandmothers may have been a dachshund, and that certainly one of his brothers-in-law is an Airedale. But at any rate, it was fixed that we should take our excellent Gissing over to the kennels to be boarded while we were in the city. Gissing's behavior was odd. He seemed in some inscrutable way to suspect that something was going to happen. The night before his departure, he disappeared and was away all night, saying good-bye to his cronies, we suppose. When we came home early in the afternoon to convoy him to Seacliff, he was nowhere to be found. But about supper-time he turned up, looking more haggard and disreputable than ever. There was a fresh scar on his face, and he was very hungry. He ate his supper hurriedly, with no dignity at all. As soon as he heard the rattle of his chain, his spirits went very low. But the admirable creature was docile. Dogs are profoundly religious at heart. They put their trust in their deities. Unlike cats, who are determined atheists and fight to the last against fate, dogs accept calmly what they see is ordered by the gods. Gissing hopped into Dame quickly, without protest, and sat in silence during the ride. His nose was unusually cold, but then that may have been only the winter evening. He had somewhat the bearing of one who is going to the dentist. Dog fanciers are always baffled and set at naught when they see Gissing, but the Seacliff veterinarian made the most penetrating remark when we arrived. He is accustomed indeed to dogs of high degree, such dogs as are favored by the north shore of Long Island, and Gissing was rather a shock to him. After a long look, what is his name, he said. Uh, Gissing, we replied, with just a little of that embarrassment we always feel when such questions are asked, for it is generally shown in the manner of the inquirer that Gissing is an unusual name, particularly for a dog who looks as though he ought to be called Rover. So we said, perhaps a little defiantly, Gissing. But the doctor misunderstood it. Guessing, he said dubiously, and looked again at the abashed quadruped. That's because he keeps you guessing what breed he is. It amuses us the more to have Gissing staying here, associated with the lordly dogs of Long Islanders who are spending the snow season in Florida, because we feel that it is rather like sending a child to a fashionable boarding school. It is probably useless as far as education is concerned, but it ought to be an interesting experience, and he may pick up a little polish. Gissing may make friends with some influential dogs who will be of help to him in future life. 
who knows it is expensive we admit but since we paid nothing for him in the first place and have used him liberally for copy we feel that we owe gissing this opportunity to improve himself at any rate he has promised to write us a letter from time to time and we shall see how he gets on end of story five story six how the dog came to live with man by mrs raffy in the happy olden days when the animals lived together at peace in the forest they used to hold fairs and markets after the manner of mankind the most important fair of all was called kailu luri lura the fair of luri lura which was held at stated intervals in boy forest country thither gathered all the animals each one bringing some article of merchandise according to the decree which demanded that every animal that came to the fair should bring something to sell no matter whether he was young or old rich or poor no one was to come empty-handed for they wanted to enhance the popularity of the market ukla the tiger was appointed governor of the fair man was excluded from these fairs as he was looked upon as an enemy he used to hunt the animals with his bow and arrows so they had ceased to fraternize with him and kept out of his way but one day the dog left his own kindred in the jungle and became the attendant of man the following story tells how that came to pass one day Uxwa, the dog walked abroad in search of goods to sell at the fair the other animals were thrifty and industrious they worked to produce their merchandise but the dog being of an indolent nature did not like to work though he was very desirous to go to the fair so to avoid the censure of his neighbours and the punishment of the governor of the fair he set out in search of something he could get without much labour to himself he trudged about the country all day inquiring at many villages but when evening time came he had not succeeded in purchasing any suitable goods and he began to fear that he would have to forego the pleasure of attending the fair after all just as the sun was setting he found himself on the outskirts of sadu village on the slopes of the shillong mountain and as he sniffed the air he became aware of a strong and peculiar odour which he guessed came from some cooked food being hungry after his long tramp he pushed his way forward following the scent till he came to a house right in the middle of the village where he saw the family at dinner which he noticed they were eating with evident relish the dinner consisted of fermented cassie beans known as katung rambai from which the strong smell emanated the cassies were naturally a very cordial and hospitable people and when the good wife of the house saw the dog standing outside looking wistfully at them she invited him to partake of what food there was left in the pot Uxua thankfully accepted and by reason of his great hunger he ate heartily regardless of the strange flavour and smell of the food and he considered the katong rumbai very palatable it dawned on him that here quite by accident he had found a novel and marketable produce to take to the fair and it happened that the kindly family who had entertained him had a quantity of the stuff for sale which they kept in earthen jars sealed with clay to retain its flavour after a little palaver according to custom a bargain was struck and Uxwa became the owner of one good-sized jar of katung rumbai which he cheerfully took on his back he made his way across the hills to luri lora fair chuckling to himself as he anticipated the sensation he would create and the profits he would gain and the praise he would win for being so enterprising on the way he encountered many of the animals who like himself were all going to luri lora and carrying merchandise on their backs to sell at the fair to them uxwa boasted of the wonderful food he had discovered and was bringing with him to the market in the earthen jar under the clay seal 
he talked so much about it that the contents of the earthen jar became the general topic of conversation between the animals for never had such an article been known at lori lura when he arrived at the fair the dog walked in with great consequence and installed himself and his earthen jar in the most central place with much clatter and ostentation then he began to shout at the top of his voice come and buy my good food and what with his boasting on the road and the noise he made at the fair a very large company gathered round him stretching their necks to have a glimpse at the strange-looking jar and burning with curiosity to see the much advertised contents uxwa with great importance proceeded to uncover the jar but as soon as he broke the clay seal a puff of the most unsavoury and fetid odour issued forth and drove all the animals scrambling to a safe distance much to the dog's discomfiture and the merriment of the crowd they hooted and jeered and made all sorts of disparaging remarks till uxwa felt himself covered with shame the stag pushed forward and to show his disdain he contemptuously kicked the earthen jar till it broke this increased the laughter and the jeering and more of the animals came forward and they began to trample the katung rumbai in the mud taking no notice of the protestations of uxwa who felt himself very unjustly treated he went to ukla the governor of the fair to ask for redress but here again he was met with ridicule and scorn and told that he deserved all the treatment he had received for filling the market-place with such a stench at last uxwa's patience wore out he grew snappish and angry and with loud barks and snarls he began to curse the animals with many curses threatening to be avenged upon them all some day at the time no one heeded his curses and threats for the dog was but a contemptible animal in their estimation and it was not thought possible for him to work much harm yet even on that day a part of his curse came true for the animals found to their dismay that the smell of the katong rumbai clung to their paws and their hoofs and could not be obliterated so the laughter was not all on their side humiliated and angry the dog determined to leave the fair and the forest and his own tribe and to seek more congenial surroundings so he went away from luri lura never to return and came once more to Sedu village to the house of the family from whom he had bought the offending food when the master of the house heard the story of the ill-treatment he had suffered from the animals he pitied uxwa and he also considered that the insults touched himself as well as the dog inasmuch as it was he who had prepared and sold the katung rumbai so he spoke consolingly to uxwa and patted his head and told him to remain in the village with him and that he would protect him and help him to avenge his wrongs upon the animals after the coming of the dog man became a very successful hunter for the dog who always accompanied him when he went out to hunt was able to follow the trail of the animals by the smell of the katung rumbai which adhered to their feet thus the animals lived to rue the day when they played their foolish pranks on uxwa and his earthen jar at the fair of lori lura man having other occupations could not always go abroad to the jungle to hunt so in order to secure a supply of meat for himself during the non-hunting season he tamed pigs and kept them at hand in the village when the dog came he shared the dwellings and the meals of the pig Ushnang. they spent their days in idleness living on the bounty of man one evening as man was returning from his field tired with the day's toil he noticed the two idle animals and he said to himself it is very foolish of me to do all the hard work myself while these two well-fed creatures are lying idle they ought to take a turn at doing some work for their food the following morning man commanded the two animals to go to the field to plough in his stead when they arrived there usnang in obedience to his master's orders began to dig with his snout and by nightfall had managed to furrow quite a large patch of the field 
but Uxu, according to his indolent habits, did no work at all. He lay in the shade all day, or amused himself by snapping at the flies. In the evening, when it was time to go home, he would start running backwards and forwards over the furrows, much to the annoyance of the pig. The same thing happened for many days in succession, till the patience of the pig was exhausted, and on their return from the field one evening, he went and informed their master of the conduct of the dog, how he was idling the whole day, and leaving all the work for him to do. The master was loath to believe these charges against Uxu, whom he had found such an active and willing helper in the chase. He therefore determined to go and examine the field. When he came there, he found only a few of the footprints of the pig, while those of the dog were all over the furrows. He at once concluded that Utsnang had falsely charged his friend, and he was exceedingly wroth with him. When he came home, man called the two animals to him, and he spoke very angrily to Utsnang, and told him that henceforth he would have to live in the little sty by himself, and to eat only the refuse from man's table and other common food, as a punishment for making false charges against his friend. But the dog would be privileged to live in the house with his master, and to share the food of his master's family." Thus it was that the dog came to live with man. End of Story 6 Story 7 A Dog's Tale by Mark Twain Chapter 1 My father was a St. Bernard, my mother was a Collie, but I am a Presbyterian. This is what my mother told me. I do not know these nice distinctions myself. To me they are only fine large words meaning nothing. My mother had a fondness for such. She liked to say them, and see other dogs look surprised and envious, as wondering how she got so much education. But indeed it was not real education, it was only show. She got the words by listening in the dining room and drawing room when there was company, and by going with the children to Sunday school and listening there and whenever she heard a large word, she said it over to herself many times, and so was able to keep it until there was a dogmatic gathering in the neighborhood, then she would get it off and surprise and distress them all, from pocket pup to mastiff, which rewarded her for all her trouble. If there was a stranger, he was nearly sure to be suspicious, and when he got his breath again, he would ask her what it meant and she always told him. He was never expecting this, but thought he would catch her. So when she told him, he was the one that looked ashamed, whereas he had thought it was going to be she. The others were always waiting for this, and glad of it and proud of her, for they knew what was going to happen, because they had had experience. When she told the meaning of a big word, they were all so taken up with admiration that it never occurred to any dog to doubt if it was the right one, and that was natural, because, for one thing, she answered up so promptly that it seemed like a dictionary speaking, and for another thing, where could they find out whether it was right or not? For she was the only cultivated dog there. By and by, when I was older, she brought home the word unintellectual one time, and worked it pretty hard all the week at different gatherings, making much unhappiness and despondency. And it was at this time that I noticed that during that week she was asked for the meaning at eight different assemblages, and flashed out a fresh definition every time, which showed me that she had more presence of mind than culture though i said nothing of course she had one word which she always kept on hand and ready like a life preserver a kind of emergency word to strap on when she was likely to get washed overboard in a sudden way that was the word synonymous when she happened to fetch out a long word which had had its day weeks before and its prepared meanings gone to her dump pile if there was a stranger there, of course it knocked him groggy for a couple of minutes, then he would come to, and by that time she would be away downwind on another tack, and not expecting anything. 
so when he'd hail and ask her to cash in i the only dog on the inside of her game could see her canvas flicker a moment but only just a moment then it would belly out taut and full and she would say as calm as a summer's day it's synonymous with supererogation or some godless long reptile of a word like that and go placidly about and skim away on the next tack perfectly comfortable you know and leave the stranger looking profane and embarrassed and the initiated slatting the floor with their tails in unison and their faces transfigured with holy joy and it was the same with phrases she would drag home a whole phrase if it had a grand sound and play it six nights in two matinees and explain it a new way every time which she had to for all she cared for was the phrase she wasn't interested in what it meant and knew those dogs hadn't wit enough to catch her anyway yes she was a daisy she got so she wasn't afraid of anything she had such confidence in the ignorance of those creatures she even brought anecdotes that she had heard the family and the dinner guests laugh and shout over and as a rule she got the nub of one chestnut hitched on to another chestnut where of course it didn't fit and hadn't any point and when she delivered the nub she fell over and rolled on the floor and laughed and barked in the most insane way while i could see that she was wondering to herself why it didn't seem as funny as it did when she first heard it but no harm was done the others rolled and barked too privately ashamed of themselves for not seeing the point and never suspecting that the fault was not with them and there wasn't any to see you can see by these things that she was of a rather vain and frivolous character still she had virtues and enough to make up i think she had a kind heart and gentle ways and never harboured resentments for injuries done her but put them easily out of her mind and forgot them and she taught her children her kindly way and from her we learned also to be brave and prompt in time of danger and not to run away but face the peril that threatened friend or stranger and help him the best we could without stopping to think what the cost might be to us and she taught us not by words only but by example and that is the best way and the surest and the most lasting why the brave things she did the splendid things she was just a soldier and so modest about it well you couldn't help admiring her and you couldn't help imitating her not even a king charles spaniel could remain entirely despicable in her society so as you see there was more to her than her education chapter two when i was well grown at last i was sold and taken away and i never saw her again she was broken-hearted and so was i and we cried but she comforted me as well as she could and said we were sent into this world for a wise and good purpose and must do our duties without repining take our life as we might find it live it for the best good of others and never mind about the results they were not our affair she said men who did like this would have a noble and beautiful reward by and by in another world and although we animals could not go there to do well and right without reward would give to our brief lives a worthiness and dignity which in itself would be a reward she had gathered these things from time to time when she had gone to the sunday school with the children and had laid them up in her memory more carefully than she had done with those other words and phrases and she had studied them deeply for her good and ours one may see by this that she had a wise and thoughtful head for all there was so much lightness and vanity in it so we said our farewells and looked our last upon each other through our tears and the last thing she said keeping it for the last to make me remember it the better i think was in memory of me when there is a time of danger to another do not think of yourself think of your mother and do as she would do do you think i could forget that no chapter three 
It was such a charming home, my new one, a fine great house with pictures and delicate decorations and rich furniture and no gloom anywhere, but all the wilderness of dainty colors lit up with flooding sunshine, and the spacious grounds around it and the great garden, oh, greensward and noble trees and flowers, no end. And I was the same as a member of the family and they loved me and petted me and did not give me a new name but called me by my old one that was dear to me because my mother had given it me eileen mavonin she got it out of a song and the greys knew that song and said it was a beautiful name mrs gray was thirty and so sweet and so lovely you cannot imagine it and sadie was ten and just like her mother just a darling slender little copy of her with auburn tails down her back and short frocks and the baby was a year old and plump and dimpled and fond of me and never could get enough of hauling on my tail and hugging me and laughing out its innocent happiness and mr gray was thirty-eight and tall and slender and handsome a little bald in front alert quick in his movements business-like prompt decided unsentimental and with that kind of trim chiselled face that just seems to glint and sparkle with frosty intellectuality he was a renowned scientist i do not know what the word means but my mother would know how to use it and get effects she would know how to depress a rat terrier with it and make a lapdog look sorry he came but that is not the best one the best one was laboratory my mother would organize a trust on that one that would skin the tax dollars off the whole herd the laboratory was not a book or a picture or a place to wash your hands in as the college president's dog said no that is the lavatory the laboratory is quite different and is filled with jars and bottles and electrics and wires and strange machines and every week other scientists came there and sat in the place and used the machines and discussed and made what they called experiments and discoveries and often i came too and stood around and listened and tried to learn for the sake of my mother and in loving memory of her although it was a pain to me as realizing what she was losing out of her life and i gaining nothing at all for try as i might i was never able to make anything out of it at all other times i lay on the floor in the mistress's workroom and slept she gently using me for a footstool knowing it pleased me for it was a caress other times i spent an hour in the nursery and got well tousled and made happy other times i watched by the crib there when the baby was asleep and the nurse out for a few minutes on the baby's affairs other times i romped and raced through the grounds and the garden with sadie till we were tired out then slumbered on the grass in the shade of a tree while she read her book other times i went visiting among the neighbor dogs for there were some pleasant ones not far away and one very handsome and courteous and graceful one a curly-haired irish setter by the name of robin adair who was a presbyterian like me and belonged to the scotch minister the servants in our house were all kind to me and were fond of me and so as you see mine was a pleasant life there could not be a happier dog that i was nor a gratefuler one i will say this for myself for it is only the truth i tried in all ways to do well and right and honour my mother's memory and her teachings and earn the happiness that had come to me as best i could by and by came my little puppy and then my cup was full my happiness was perfect it was the dearest little waddling thing and so smooth and soft and velvety and had such cunning little awkward paws and such affectionate eyes and such a sweet and innocent face and it made me so proud to see how the children and their mother adored it and fondled it and exclaimed over every little wonderful thing it did it did seem to me that life was just too lovely to and then came the winter 
one day i was standing a watch in the nursery that is to say i was asleep on the bed the baby was asleep in the crib which was alongside the bed on the side next the fireplace it was the kind of crib that has a lofty tent over it made of gauzy stuff that you can see through the nurse was out and we two sleepers were alone a spark from the wood fire was shot out and it lit on the slope of the tent i suppose a quiet interval followed then a scream from the baby awoke me and there was that tent flaming up toward the ceiling before i could think i sprang to the floor in my fright and in a second was halfway to the door but in the next half second my mother's farewell was sounding in my ears and i was back on the bed again i reached my head through the flames and dragged the baby out by the waistband and tugged it along and we fell to the floor together in a cloud of smoke i snatched a new hold and dragged the screaming little creature along and out at the door and around the bend of the hall and was still tugging away all excited and happy and proud when the master's voice shouted be gone you cursed beast and i jumped to save myself but he was furiously quick and chased me up striking furiously at me with his cane i dodged this way and that in terror and at last a strong blow fell upon my left foreleg which made me shriek and fall for the moment helpless the cane went up for another blow but never descended for the nurse's voice rang wildly out the nursery's on fire and the master rushed away in that direction and my other bones were saved the pain was cruel but no matter i must not lose any time he might come back at any moment so i limped on three legs to the other end of the hall where there was a dark little stairway leading up into a garret where old boxes and such things were kept as i had heard say and where people seldom went i managed to climb up there then i searched my way through the dark among the piles of things and hid in the secretest place i could find it was foolish to be afraid there yet still i was so afraid that i held in and hardly even whimpered though it would have been such a comfort to whimper because that eases the pain you know but i could lick my leg and that did some good for half an hour there was a commotion downstairs and shoutings and rushing footsteps and then there was quiet again quiet for some minutes and that was grateful to my spirit for then my fears began to go down and fears are worse than pains oh much worse then came a sound that froze me they were calling me calling me by name hunting for me it was muffled by distance but that could not take the terror out of it and it was the most dreadful sound to me that i had ever heard it went all about everywhere down there along the halls through all the rooms in both stories and in the basement and the cellar then outside and farther and farther away then back and all about the house again and i thought it would never never stop but at last it did hours and hours after the vague twilight of the garret had long ago been blotted out by black darkness then in that blessed stillness my terrors fell little by little away and i was at peace and slept it was a good rest i had but i woke before the twilight had come again i was feeling fairly comfortable and i could think out a plan now i made a very good one which was to creep down all the way down the back stairs and hide behind the cellar door and slip out and escape when the iceman came at dawn while he was inside filling the refrigerator then i would hide all day and start on my journey when night came my journey to well anywhere where they would not know me and betray me to the master i was feeling almost cheerful now then suddenly i thought why what would life be without my puppy that was despair there was no plan for me i saw that i must stay where i was stay and wait and take what might come it was not my affair that was what life is my mother had said it then well then the calling began again all my sorrows came back i said to myself the master will never forgive 
i did not know what i had done to make him so bitter and so unforgiving yet i judged it was something a dog could not understand but which was clear to a man and dreadful they called and called days and nights it seemed to me so long that the hunger and thirst near drove me mad and i recognized that i was getting very weak when you are this way you sleep a great deal and i did once i woke in an awful fright it seemed to me that the calling was right there in the garret and so it was it was sadie's voice and she was crying my name was falling from her lips all broken poor thing and i could not believe my ears for the joy of it when i heard her say come back to us oh come back to us and forgive it is all so sad without our i broke in with such a grateful little yelp and the next moment sadie was plunging and stumbling through the darkness and the lumber and shouting for the family to hear she's found she's found the days that followed well they were wonderful the mother and sadie and the servants why they just seemed to worship me they couldn't seem to make me a bed that was fine enough and as for food they couldn't be satisfied with anything but game and delicacies that were out of season and every day the friends and neighbors flocked in to hear about my heroism that was the name they called it by and it means agriculture i remember my mother pulling it on a kennel once and explaining it in that way but didn't say what agriculture was except that it was synonymous with intramural incandescence and a dozen times a day mrs gray and sadie would tell the tale to newcomers and say i risked my life to save the babies and both of us had burns to prove it and then the company would pass me around and pet me and exclaim about me and you could see the pride in the eyes of sadie and her mother and when the people wanted to know what made me limp they looked ashamed and changed the subject and sometimes when people hunted them this way and that way with questions about it it looked to me as if they were going to cry and this was not all the glory no the master's friends came a whole twenty of the most distinguished people and had me in the laboratory and discussed me as if i was a kind of discovery and some of them said it was wonderful in a dumb beast the finest exhibition of instinct they could call to mind but the master said with vehemence it's far above instinct it's reason and many a man privileged to be saved and go with you and me to a better world by right of its possession has less of it than this poor silly quadruped that's foreordained to perish and then he laughed and said why look at me i'm a sarcasm bless you with my grand intelligence the only thing i inferred was that the dog had gone mad and was destroying the child whereas but for the beast's intelligence its reason i tell you the child would have perished they disputed and disputed and i was the very centre of subject of it all and i wished my mother could know that this grand honour had come to me it would have made her proud then they discussed optics as they called it and whether a certain injury to the brain would produce blindness or not but they could not agree about it and said they must test it by experiment by and by and next they discussed plants and that interested me because in the summer sadie and i had planted seeds i helped her dig the holes you know and after days and days a little shrub or a flower came up there and it was a wonder how that could happen but it did and i wished i could talk i would have told those people about it and shown them how much i knew and been all alive with the subject but i didn't care for the optics it was dull and when they came back to it again it bored me and i went to sleep pretty soon it was spring and sunny and pleasant and lovely and the sweet mother and the children patted me and the puppy good-bye and went away on a journey and a visit to their ken and the master wasn't any company for us but we played together and had good times and the servants were kind and friendly so we got along quite happily and counted the days and waited for the family and one day those men came again and said now for the test 
and they took the puppy to the laboratory, and I limped three-leggedly along, too, feeling proud, for any attention shown to the puppy was a pleasure to me, of course. They discussed and experimented, and then suddenly the puppy shrieked, and they set him on the floor, and he went staggering around with his head all bloody, and the master clapped his hands and shouted, There, I've won! Confess it! He's as blind as a bat! And they all said, it's so you've proved your theory and suffering humanity owes you a great debt from henceforth and they crowded around him and wrung his hand cordially and thankfully and praised him but i hardly saw or heard these things for i ran at once to my little darling and snuggled close to it where it lay and licked the blood and put its head against mine whimpering softly and i knew in my heart it was a comfort to it in its pain and trouble to feel its mother's touch though it could not see me then it dropped down presently and its little velvet nose rested upon the floor and it was still and did not move any more soon the master stopped discussing a moment and rang in the footman and said bury it in the far corner of the garden and then went on with the discussion, and I trotted after the footman, very happy and grateful, for I knew the puppy was out of its pain now, because it was asleep. We went far down the garden to the farthest end, where the children and the nurse and the puppy and I used to play in the summer in the shade of a great elm, and there the footman dug a hole, and I saw he was going to plant the puppy, and I was glad, because it would grow and come up a fine handsome dog like Robin Adair, and be a beautiful surprise for the family when they came home. So I tried to help him dig, but my lame leg was no good, being stiff, you know, and you have to have two, or it is no use. When the footman had finished and covered little Robin up, he patted my head, and there were tears in his eyes, and he said, Poor little doggy, you saved his child. I have watched two whole weeks, and he doesn't come up. This last week a fright has been stealing upon me. I think there is something terrible about this. I do not know what it is, but the fear makes me sick, and I cannot eat, though the servants bring me the best of food. And they pet me so, and even come in the night, and cry, and say, Poor doggy, do give it up and come home, don't break our hearts. And all this terrifies me the more, and makes me sure something has happened. And I am so weak, since yesterday I cannot stand on my feet any more, and within this hour the servants, looking toward the sun, where it was sinking out of sight, and the night chill coming on, said things I could not understand, but they carried something cold to my heart. Those poor creatures, they do not suspect, they will come home in the morning, and eagerly ask for the little doggie that did the brave deed, and who of us will be strong enough to say the truth to them? The humble little friend is gone, where go the beasts that perish? End of Story 7 Story 8 Lobo, the King of Kurumpah by Ernest Thompson Seton 1. Kurumpah is a vast cattle range in northern New Mexico. It is a land of rich pastures and teeming flocks and herds, a land of rolling mesas and precious running waters that at length unite in the Kurumpah River, from which the whole region is named, and the king, whose despotic power was felt over its entire extent, was an old gray wolf. Old Lobo, or the king, as the Mexicans called him, was the gigantic leader of a remarkable pack of gray wolves that had ravaged the Kurumpah Valley for a number of years. All the shepherds and ranchmen knew him well, and wherever he appeared with his trusty band, terror reigned supreme among the cattle, and wrath and despair among their owners. Old Lobo was a giant among wolves, and was cunning and strong in proportion to his size. His voice at night was well known and easily distinguished from that of any of his fellows. An ordinary wolf might howl half the night about the herdsman's bivouac without attracting more than a passing notice. But when the deep roar of the old king came booming down the canyon, the watcher bestirred himself and prepared to learn in the morning that fresh and serious inroads had been made among the herds. 
old lobo's band was but a small one this i never quite understood for usually when a wolf rises to the position and power that he had he attracts a numerous following it may be that he had as many as he desired and perhaps his ferocious temper prevented the increase of his pack certain it is that lobo had only five followers during the latter part of his reign each of these however was a wolf of renown most of them were above the ordinary size one in particular the second in command was a veritable giant but even he was far below the leader in size and prowess several of the band besides the two leaders were especially noted one of those was a beautiful white wolf that the mexicans called blanca there was supposed to be a female possibly lobo's mate another was a yellow wolf of remarkable swiftness which according to current stories had on several occasions captured an antelope for the pack it will be seen then that these wolves were thoroughly well known to the cowboys and shepherds they were frequently seen and oftener heard and their lives were intimately associated with those of the cattlemen who would so gladly have destroyed them there was not a stockman on the currumpaw who would not readily have given the value of many steers for the scalp of any one of lobo's band but they seemed to possess charmed lives and defied all manner of devices to kill them they scorned all hunters derided all poisons and continued for at least five years to exact their tribute from the currumpaw ranchers to the extent many said of a cow each day according to this estimate therefore the band had killed more than two thousand of the finest stock for as was only too well known they selected the best in every instance the old idea that a wolf was constantly in a starving state and therefore ready to eat anything was as far as possible from the truth in this case for these freebooters were always sleek and well conditioned and were in fact most fastidious about what they ate any animal that had died from natural causes or that was diseased or tainted they would not touch and they even rejected anything that had been killed by the stockmen their choice and daily food was the tenderer part of a freshly killed yearling heifer an old bull or cow they disdained and though they occasionally took a young calf or colt it was quite clear that veal or horse flesh was not their favorite diet it was also known that they were not fond of mutton although they often amused themselves by killing sheep one night in november eighteen ninety three blanca and the yellow wolf killed two hundred and fifty sheep apparently for the fun of it and did not eat an ounce of their flesh these are examples of many stories which i might repeat to show the ravages of this destructive band many new devices for their extinction were tried each year but still they lived and throve in spite of all the efforts of their foes a great price was set on lobo's head and in consequence poison in a score of subtle forms was put out for him but he never failed to detect and avoid it one thing only he feared that was firearms and knowing full well that all men in this region carried them he never was known to attack or face a human being indeed the set policy of his band was to take refuge in flight whenever in the daytime a man was descried no matter at what distance lobo's habit of permitting the pack to eat only that which they themselves had killed was in numerous cases their salvation and the keenness of his scent to detect the taint of human hands or the poison itself completed their immunity on one occasion one of the cowboys heard the too familiar rallying cry of old lobo and stealthily approaching he found the currumpaw pack in a hollow where they had rounded up a small herd of cattle lobo sat apart on a knoll while blanca with the rest was endeavoring to cut out a young cow which they had selected but the cattle were standing in a compact mass with their heads outward and presented to the foe a line of horns unbroken save when some cow frightened by a fresh onslaught of the wolves tried to retreat into the middle of the herd 
it was only by taking advantage of these breaks that the wolves had succeeded at all in wounding the selected cow but she was far from being disabled and it seemed that lobo at length lost patience with his followers for he left his position on the hill and uttering a deep roar dashed toward the herd the terrified rank broke at his charge and he sprang in among them then the cattle scattered like the pieces of a bursting bomb away went the chosen victim but ere she had gone twenty-five yards lobo was upon her seizing her by the neck he suddenly held back with all his force and so threw her heavily to the ground the shock must have been tremendous for the heifer was thrown heels over head lobo also turned a somersault but immediately recovered himself and his followers falling on the poor cow killed her in a few seconds lobo took no part in the killing after having thrown the victim he seemed to say now why could not some of you have done that at once without wasting so much time the man now rode up shouting the wolves as usual retired and he having a bottle of strychnine quickly poisoned the carcass in three places then went away knowing they would return to feed as they had killed the animal themselves but next morning on going to look for his expected victims he found that although the wolves had eaten the heifer they had carefully cut out and thrown aside all those parts that had been poisoned the dread of this great wolf spread yearly among the ranchmen and each year a larger price was set on his head until at last it reached a thousand dollars an unparalleled wolf bounty surely many a good man has been hunted down for less tempted by the promised reward a texan ranger named channery came one day galloping up the canyon of the currumpaw he had a superb outfit for wolf hunting the best of guns and horses and a pack of enormous wolfhounds far out on the plains of the panhandle he and his dogs had killed many a wolf and now he never doubted that within a few days old lobo's scalp would dangle at his saddle-bow away they went bravely on their hunt in the gray dawn of a summer morning and soon the great dogs gave joyous tongue to say that they were already on the track of their quarry within two miles the grisly band of currumpaw leaped into view and the chase grew fast and furious the part of the wolfhounds was merely to hold the wolves at bay till the hunter could ride up and shoot them and this usually was easy on the open plains of texas but here a new feature of the country came into play and showed how well lobo had chosen his range for the rocky canyon of the currumpaw and its tributaries intersect the prairies in every direction the old wolf at once made for the nearest of these and by crossing it got rid of the horsemen his band then scattered and thereby scattered the dogs and when they reunited at a distant point of course all the dogs did not turn up and the wolves no longer outnumbered turned on their pursuers and killed or desperately wounded them all that night when tannery mustered his dogs only six of them returned and of these two were terribly lacerated this hunter made two other attempts to capture the royal scalp but neither of them was more successful than the first and on the last occasion his best horse met its death by a fall so he gave up the chase in disgust and went back to texas leaving lobo more than ever the despot of the region next year two other hunters appeared determined to win the promised bounty each believed he could destroy this noted wolf the first by means of a newly devised poison which was to be laid out in an entirely new manner the other a french canadian by poison assisted with certain spells and charms for he firmly believed that lobo was a veritable loup garou and could not be killed by ordinary means but cunningly compounded poisons charms and incantations were all of no avail against this grisly devastator he made his weekly rounds and daily banquets as aforetime and before many weeks had passed calonne and laloche gave up in despair and went elsewhere to hunt 
In the spring of 1893, after his unsuccessful attempt to capture Lobo, Joe Calone had a humiliating experience, which seems to show that the big wolf simply scorned his enemies and had absolute confidence in himself. Calone's farm was on a small tributary of the Coramba, in a picturesque canyon, and among the rocks of this very canyon, within a thousand yards of the house, old Lobo and his mate selected their den and raised their family that season. There they lived all summer and killed Joe's cattle, sheep, and dogs, but laughed at all his poisons and traps, and rested securely among the recesses of the cavernous cliffs, while Joe vainly racked his brains for some method of smoking them out or of reaching them with dynamite but they escaped entirely unscathed, and continued their ravages as before. "'There's where he lived all last summer,' said Joe, pointing to the face of the cliff, "'and I couldn't do a thing with him. I was like a fool to him.'" 2. This history, gathered so far from the cowboys, I found hard to believe, until, in the fall of 1893, I made the acquaintance of the wily marauder, and at length came to know him more thoroughly than anyone else. Some years before, in the bingo days, I had been a wolf hunter, but my occupation since then had been of another sort, chaining me to stool and desk. I was much in need of a change, and when a friend, who was also a ranch owner on the Coramba, asked me to come to New Mexico and try if I could do anything with this predatory pack, I accepted the invitation, and eager to make the acquaintance of its king, was as soon as possible among the mesas of that region. I spent some time riding about to learn the country, and at intervals my guide would point to the skeleton of a cow to which the hide still adhered, and remark, that's some of his work. It became quite clear to me that in this rough country it was useless to think of pursuing Lobo with hounds and horses, so that poison or traps were the only available expedients. At present we had no traps large enough, so I set to work with poison. I need not enter into the details of a hundred devices that I employed to circumvent this loup de rue. There was no combination of strychnine, arsenic, cyanide, or prussic acid that I did not assay. There was no manner of flesh that I did not try as bait but morning after morning, as I rode forth to learn the result, I found that all my efforts had been useless. The old king was too cunning for me. A single instance will show his wonderful sagacity. Acting on the hint of an old trapper, I melted some cheese together with the kidney fat of a freshly killed heifer, stewing it in a china dish, and cutting it with a bone knife to avoid the taint of metal." When the mixture was cool, I cut it into lumps, and, making a hole in one side of each lump, I inserted a large dose of strychnine and cyanide, contained in a capsule that was impermeable by any odor. Finally, I sealed the holes up with pieces of the cheese itself. During the whole process, I wore a pair of gloves steeped in the hot blood of the heifer, and even avoided breathing on the baits. When all was ready, I put them in a raw hide bag, rubbed all over with blood, and rode forth dragging the liver and kidneys of the beef at the end of a rope. With this I made a ten-mile circuit, dropping a bait at each quarter of a mile, and taking the utmost care, always not to touch any with my hands. Lobo generally came into this part of the range in the early part of each week, and passed the latter part it was supposed, around the base of Sierra Grande. This was Monday, and that same evening, as we were about to retire, I heard the deep bass howl of His Majesty. On hearing it, one of the boys briefly remarked, There he is. We'll see. The next morning I went forth, eager to know the result. I soon came on the fresh trail of the robbers, with Lobo in the lead. His track was always easily distinguished, an ordinary wolf's forefoot is four and a half inches long, that of a large wolf four and three-quarter inches, but Lobo's, as measured a number of times, was five and a half inches from claw to heel. 
i afterward found that his other proportions were commensurate for he stood three feet high at the shoulder and weighed a hundred and fifty pounds his trail therefore though obscured by those of his followers was never difficult to trace the pack had soon found the track of my drag and as usual followed it i could see that lobo had come to the first bait sniffed about it and finally had picked it up then i could not conceal my delight i've got him at last i exclaimed i shall find him stark within a mile and i galloped on with eager eyes fixed on the great broad track in the dust it led me to the second bait and that also was gone how i exulted i surely have him now and perhaps several of his band but there was the broad paw mark still on the drag and though i stood in the stirrup and scanned the plain i saw nothing that looked like a dead wolf again i followed to find now that the third bait was gone and the king wolf's track led on to the fourth there to learn that he had not really taken a bait at all but had merely carried them in his mouth then having piled the three on the fourth he scattered filth over them to express his utter contempt for my devices after this he left my drag and went about his business with the pack he guarded so effectively this is only one of many similar experiences which convinced me that poison would never avail to destroy this robber and though i continued to use it while awaiting the arrival of the traps it was only because it was meanwhile a sure means of killing many prairie wolves and other destructive vermin about this time there came under my observation an incident that will illustrate lobo's diabolical cunning these wolves had at least one pursuit which was merely an amusement it was stampeding and killing sheep though they rarely ate them the sheep are usually kept in flocks of from one thousand to three thousand under one or more shepherds at night they are gathered in the most sheltered place available and a herdsman sleeps on each side of the flock to give additional protection sheep are such senseless creatures that they are liable to be stampeded by the veriest trifle but they have deeply ingrained in their nature one and perhaps only one strong weakness namely to follow their leader and this the shepherds turn to good account by putting half a dozen goats in the flock of sheep the latter recognized the superior intelligence of their bearded cousins and when a night alarm occurs they crowd around them and usually are thus saved from a stampede and are easily protected but it was not always so one night late in last november two patico shepherds were aroused by an onset of wolves their flocks huddled around the goats which being neither fools nor cowards stood their ground and were bravely defiant but alas for them no common wolf was heading this attack old lobo the werewolf knew as well as the shepherds that the goats were the moral force of the flock so hastily running over the backs of the densely packed sheep he fell on these leaders slew them all in a few minutes and soon had the luckless sheep stampeding in a thousand different directions for weeks afterwards i was almost daily accosted by some anxious shepherd who asked have you seen any stray oto sheep lately and usually i was obliged to say i had one day it was yes i came on some five or six carcasses by diamond springs or another it was to the effect that i had seen a small bunch running on the malpai mesa or again no but juan myra saw about twenty freshly killed on the cedra monte two days ago at length the wolf traps arrived and with two men i worked a whole week to get them properly set out we spared no labor or pains i adopted every device i could think of that might help to ensure success the second day after the traps arrived i rode around to inspect and soon came upon lobo's trail running from trap to trap in the dust i could read the whole story of his doings that night he had trotted along in the darkness and although the traps were so carefully concealed he had instantly detected the first one stopping the onward march of the pack 
he had cautiously scratched around it until he had disclosed the trap the chain and the log then left them wholly exposed to view with the trap still unsprung and passing on he treated over a dozen traps in the same fashion very soon i noticed that he stopped and turned aside as soon as he detected suspicious signs on the trail and a new plan to outwit him at once suggested itself i set the traps in the form of an h that is with a row of traps on each side of the trail and one on the trail for the crossbar of the h before long i had an opportunity to count another failure lobo came trotting along the trail and was fairly between the parallel lines before he detected the single trap on the trail but he stopped in time and why or how he knew enough i cannot tell the angel of the wild things must have been with him but without turning an inch to the right or left he slowly and cautiously backed on his own tracks putting each paw exactly in its old track until he was off the dangerous ground then returning at one side he scratched clods and stones with his hind feet till he had sprung every trap this he did on many other occasions and although i varied my methods and redoubled my precautions he was never deceived his sagacity seemed never at fault and he might have been pursuing his career of rapine to-day but for an unfortunate alliance that proved his ruin and added his name to the long list of heroes who unassailable when alone have fallen through the indiscretion of a trusted ally three once or twice i had found indications that everything was not quite right in the currumpaw pack there were signs of irregularity i thought for instance there was clearly the trail of a smaller wolf running ahead of the leader at times and this i could not understand until a cowboy made a remark which explained the matter i see them to-day he said and the wild one that breaks away is blanca then the truth dawned upon me and i added now i know that blanca is a she-wolf because were a he-wolf to act thus lobo would kill him at once this suggested a new plan i killed a heifer and set one or two rather obvious traps about the carcass then cutting off the head which is considered useless awful and quite beneath the notice of a wolf i set it a little apart and around it placed six powerful steel traps properly deodorized and concealed with the utmost care during my operations i kept my hands boots and implements smeared with fresh blood and afterwards sprinkled the ground with the same as though it had flowed from the head and when the traps were buried in the dust i brushed the place over with the skin of a coyote and with a foot of the same animal made a number of tracks over the traps the head was so placed that there was a narrow passage between it and some tussocks and in this passage i buried two of my best traps fastening them to the head itself wolves have a habit of approaching every carcass they get the wind of in order to examine it even when they have no intention of eating it and i hoped that this habit would bring the currumpaw pack within reach of my latest stratagem i did not doubt that lobo would detect my handiwork about the meat and prevent the pack approaching it but i did build some hopes on the head for it looked as though it had been thrown aside as useless next morning i sallied forth to inspect the traps and there oh joy were the tracks of the pack and the place where the beef head and its traps had been was empty a hasty study of the trail showed that lobo had kept the pack from approaching the meat but one a small wolf had evidently gone on to examine the head as it lay apart and had walked right into one of the traps we set out on the trail and within a mile discovered that the hapless wolf was blanca away she went however at a gallop and although encumbered by the beef head which weighed over fifty pounds she speedily distanced my companion who was on foot but we overtook her when she reached the rocks for the horns of the cow's head became caught and held her fast she was the handsomest wolf i had ever seen her coat was in perfect condition and nearly white 
she turned to fight and raising her voice in the rallying cry of her race sent a long howl rolling over the canyon from far away upon the mesa came a deep response the cry of old lobo that was her last call for now we had closed in on her and all her energy and breath were devoted to combat then followed the inevitable tragedy the idea of which i shrank from afterward more than at the time we each threw a lasso over the head of the doomed wolf and strained our horses in opposite directions until the blood burst from her mouth her eyes glazed her limbs stiffened and then fell limp homeward then we rode carrying the dead wolf and exulting over this the first death blow we had been able to inflict on the kurumpah pack at intervals during the tragedy and afterwards as we rode homeward we heard the roar of lobo as he wandered about on the distant mesas where he seemed to be searching for blanca he had never really deserted her but knowing that he could not save her his deep-rooted dread of firearms had been too much for him when he saw us approaching all that day we heard him wailing as he roamed in his quest and i remarked at length to one of the boys now indeed i truly know that blanca was his mate as evening fell he seemed to be coming toward the home canyon for his voice sounded continually nearer there was an unmistakable note of sorrow in it now it was no longer the loud defiant howl but a long plaintive wail blanca blanca he seemed to call and as night came down i noticed that he was not far from the place where we had overtaken her at length he seemed to find the trail and when he came to the spot where we had killed her his heartbroken wailing was piteous to hear it was sadder than i could possibly have believed even the stolid cowboys noticed it and said that they had never heard a wolf carry on like that before he seemed to know exactly what had taken place for her blood had stained the place of her death then he took up the trail of the horses and followed it to the ranch house whether in hopes of finding her there or in quest of revenge i know not but the latter was what he found for he surprised our unfortunate watchdog outside and tore him to little bits within fifty yards of the door he evidently came alone this time for i found but one trail next morning and he had galloped about in a reckless manner that was very unusual with him i had half expected this and had set a number of additional traps about the pasture afterward i found that he had indeed fallen into one of these but such was his strength he had torn himself loose and cast it aside i believe that he would continue in the neighborhood until he found her body at least so i concentrated all my energies on this one enterprise of catching him before he left the region and while yet in this reckless mood then i realized what a mistake i had made in killing blanca for by using her as a decoy i might have secured him the next night i gathered in all the traps i could command one hundred and thirty strong steel wolf traps and set them in fours in every trail that led into the canyon each trap was separately fastened to a log and each log was separately buried in burying them i carefully removed the sod and every particle of earth that was lifted we put in blankets so that after the sod was replaced and all was finished the eye could detect no trace of human handiwork when the traps were concealed i trailed the body of poor blanca over each place and made it a drag that circled all about the ranch and finally i took off one of her paws and made with it a line of tracks over each trap every precaution and device known to me i used and retired at a late hour to await the result once during the night i thought i heard old lobo but was not sure of it next day i rode around but darkness came on before i completed the circuit of the north canyon and i had nothing to report at supper one of the cowboys said there was a great row among the cattle in the north canyon this morning maybe there is something in the traps there it was afternoon of the next day before i got to the place referred to and as i drew near a great grisly form arose from the ground vainly endeavoring to escape 
and there revealed before me stood lobo king of the kurumpau firmly held in the traps poor old hero he had never ceased to search for his darling and when he found the trail her body had made he followed it recklessly and so fell into the snare prepared for him there he lay in the iron grasp of all four traps perfectly helpless and all around him were numerous tracks showing how the cattle had gathered about him to insult the fallen despot without daring to approach within his reach for two days and two nights he had lain there and now was worn out with struggling yet when i went near him he rose up with bristling mane and raised his voice and for the last time made the canyon reverberate with his deep bass roar a call for help the muster call of his band but there was none to answer him and left alone in his extremity he whirled about with all his strength and made a desperate effort to get at me all in vain each trap was a dead drag of over three hundred pounds and in their relentless fourfold grasp with great steel jaws on every foot and the heavy logs and chains all entangled together he was absolutely powerless how his huge ivory tusks did grind on those cruel chains and when i ventured to touch him with my rifle barrel he left grooves on it which are there to this day his eyes glared green with hate and fury and his jaws snapped with a hollow chop as he vainly endeavoured to reach me and my trembling horse but he was worn out with hunger and struggling and loss of blood and he soon sank exhausted to the ground something like compunction came over me as i prepared to deal out to him that which so many had suffered at his hands grand old outlaw hero of a thousand lawless raids in a few minutes you will be but a great load of carrion it cannot be otherwise then i swung my lasso and sent it whistling over his head but not so fast he was yet far from being subdued and before the supple coils had fallen on his neck he seized the noose and with one fierce chop cut through its hard thick strands and dropped it in two pieces at his feet of course i had my rifle as a last resource but i did not wish to spoil his royal hide so i galloped back to the camp and returned with a cowboy and a fresh lasso we threw to our victim a stick of wood which he seized in his teeth and before he could relinquish it our lassos whistled through the air and tightened on his neck yet before the light had died from his fierce eyes i cried stay we will not kill him let us take him alive to the camp he was so completely powerless now that it was easy to put a stout stick through his mouth behind his tusks and then lash his jaws with a heavy cord which was also fastened to the stick the stick kept the cord in and the cord kept the stick in so that he was harmless as soon as he felt his jaws were tied he made no further resistance and uttered no sound but looked calmly at us and seemed to say well you've got me at last do as you please with me and from that time he took no more notice of us we tied his feet securely but he never groaned nor growled nor turned his head then with our united strength we were just able to put him on my horse his breath came evenly as though sleeping and his eyes were bright and clear again but did not rest on us afar on the great rolling mesas they were fixed his passing kingdom where his famous band was now scattered and he gazed till the pony descended the pathway into the canyon and the rocks cut off the view by travelling slowly we reached the ranch in safety and after securing him with a collar and a strong chain we staked him out in the pasture and removed the cords then for the first time i could examine him closely and proved how unreliable is vulgar report when a living hero or tyrant is concerned he had not a collar of gold about his neck nor was there on his shoulders an inverted cross to denote that he had leagued himself with satan but i did find on one haunch a great broad scar that tradition says was the fang mark of juno the leader of tannery's wolfhounds a mark which she gave him the moment before he stretched her lifeless on the sand of the canyon 
I set meat and water beside him, but he paid no heed. He lay calmly on his breast and gazed with those steadfast yellow eyes away past me, down through the gateway of the canyon, over the open plains, his plains, nor moved a muscle when I touched him. When the sun went down, he was still gazing fixedly across the prairie. I expected he would call up his band when night came and prepared for them, but he had called once in his extremity, and none had come. He would never call again. A lion shorn of his strength, an eagle robbed of his freedom, or a dove bereft of his mate, all die, it is said, of a broken heart and who will aver that this grim bandit could bear the threefold brunt heart whole this only i know that when the morning dawned he was lying there still in his position of calm repose his body unwounded but his spirit was gone the old king wolf was dead i took the chain from his neck a cowboy helped me to carry him to the shed where lay the remains of blanca and as we laid him beside her the cattleman exclaimed there you would come to her now you are together again end of story eight story nine bingo the story of my dog by ernest thompson seaton one it was early in november eighteen eighty two and the manitoba winter had just set in I was tilting back in my chair for a few lazy moments after breakfast, idly alternating my gaze from the one window pane of our shanty, through which was framed a bit of the prairie and the end of our cowshed, to the old rhyme of the Franklin dog pinned on the logs nearby. But the dreamy mixture of rhyme and view was quickly dispelled by the sight of a large gray animal dashing across the prairie into the cowshed, with a smaller black and white animal in hot pursuit. A wolf, I exclaimed, and seizing a rifle, dashed out to help the dog. But before I could get there, they had left the stable, and after a short run over the snow, the wolf again turned at bay, and the dog, our neighbor's collie, circled about watching his chance to snap i fired a couple of long shots which had the effect only of setting them off again over the prairie after another run this matchless dog closed and seized the wolf by the haunch but again retreated to avoid the fierce return chop then there was another stand at bay and again a race over the snow every few hundred yards this scene was repeated the dog managing so that each fresh rush should be toward the settlement, while the wolf vainly tried to break back toward the dark belt of trees in the east. At last, after a mile of this fighting and running, I overtook them, and the dog, seeing that he now had good backing, closed in for the finish. After a few seconds, the whirl of struggling animals resolved itself into a wolf on his back, with a bleeding collie gripping his throat and it was now easy for me to step up and end the fight by putting a ball through the wolf's head then when this dog of marvellous wind saw that his foe was dead he gave him no second glance but set out at a lope for a farm four miles across the snow where he had left his master when first the wolf was started he was a wonderful dog and even if i had not come he undoubtedly would have killed the wolf alone as i learned he had already done with others of the kind in spite of the fact that the wolf though of the smaller or prairie race was much larger than himself i was filled with admiration for the dog's prowess and at once sought to buy him at any price the scornful reply of his owner was why don't you try to buy one of the children since frank was not in the market i was obliged to content myself with the next best thing one of his alleged progeny that is a son of his wife this probable offspring of an illustrious sire was a roly-poly ball of black fur that looked more like a long-tailed bear cub than a puppy but he had some tan markings like those on frank's coat that were i hoped guarantees of future greatness and also a very characteristic ring of white that he always wore on his muzzle having got possession of this person the next thing was to find him a name surely this puzzle was already solved 
the rhyme of the franklin dog was inbuilt with the foundation of our acquaintance so with adequate pomp we eclapped him little bingo two the rest of that winter bingo spent in our shanty living the life of a blubbery fat well-meaning ill-doing puppy gorging himself with food and growing bigger and clumsier each day even sad experience failed to teach him that he must keep his nose out of the rat trap his most friendly overtures to the cat were wholly misunderstood and resulted only in an armed neutrality that varied by occasional reigns of terror continued to the end which came when bingo who early showed a mind of his own got a notion for sleeping at the barn and avoiding the shanty altogether when the spring came i set about his serious education after much pains on my behalf and many pains on his he learned to go at the word in quest of our old yellow cow that pastured at will on the unfenced prairie once he had learned his business he became very fond of it and nothing pleased him more than an order to go and fetch the cow away he would dash barking with pleasure and leaping high in the air that he might better scan the plain for his victim in a short time he would return driving her at full gallop before him and gave her no peace until puffing and blowing she was safely driven into the farthest corner of her stable less energy on his part would have been more satisfactory but we bore with him until he grew so fond of this semi-daily hunt that he began to bring old dunn without being told and at length not once or twice but a dozen times a day this energetic cowherd would sally forth on his own responsibility and drive the cow home to the stable at last things came to such a pass that whenever he felt like taking a little exercise or had a few minutes of spare time or even happened to think of it bingo would sally forth at racing speed over the plain and a few minutes later return driving the unhappy yellow cow at full gallop before him at first this did not seem very bad as it kept the cow from straying too far but soon it was seen that it hindered her feeding she became thin and gave less milk it seemed to weigh on her mind too as she was always watching nervously for that hateful dog and in the morning would hang around the stable as though afraid to venture off and subject herself at once to an onset this was going too far all attempts to make bingo more moderate in his pleasure were failures so he was compelled to give it up altogether after this though he dared not bring her home he continued to show his interest by lying at her stable door while she was being milked as the summer came on the mosquitoes became a dreadful plague and the consequent vicious switching of dunn's tail at milking time was even more annoying than the mosquitoes fred the brother who did the milking was of an inventive as well as an impatient turn of mind and he devised a simple plan to stop the switching he fastened a brick to the cow's tail then set blithely about his work assured of unusual comfort while the rest of us looked on in doubt suddenly through the mist of mosquitoes came a dull whack and an outburst of language the cow went on placidly chewing till fred got on his feet and furiously attacked her with the milking stool it was bad enough to be whacked on the ear with a brick by a stupid old cow but the uproarious enjoyment and ridicule of the bystanders made it unendurable bingo hearing the uproar and divining that he was needed rushed in and attacked dunn on the other side before the affair quieted down the milk was spilt the pail and stool were broken and the cow and the dog severely beaten poor bingo could not understand it at all he had long ago learned to despise that cow and now in utter disgust he decided to forsake even her stable door and from that time he attached himself exclusively to the horses and their stable the cattle were mine the horses were my brothers and in transferring his allegiance from the cow stable to the horse stable bingo seemed to give me up too 
anything like daily companionship ceased and yet whenever any emergency arose bingo turned to me and i to him and both seem to feel that the bond between man and dog is one that lasts as long as life the only other occasion on which bingo acted as cowherd was in the autumn of the same year at the annual carbury fair among the dazzling inducements to enter one's stock there was in addition to a prospect of glory a cash prize of two dollars for the best collie in training misled by a false friend i entered bingo and early on the day fixed the cow was driven to the prairie just outside of the village when the time came she was pointed out to bingo and the word given go fetch the cow it was the intention of course that he should bring her to me at the judge's stand but the animals knew better they hadn't rehearsed all summer for nothing when dunn saw bingo's careering form she knew that her only hope for safety was to get into her stable and bingo was equally sure that his sole mission in life was to quicken her pace in that direction so off they raced over the prairie like a wolf after a deer and heading straight toward their home two miles away they disappeared from view that was the last that judge or jury ever saw of dog or cow the prize was awarded to the only other entry three bingo's loyalty to the horses was quite remarkable by day he trotted beside them and by night he slept at the stable door where the team went bingo went and nothing kept him away from them this interesting assumption of ownership lent the greater significance to the following circumstance i was not superstitious and up to this time had had no faith in omens but was now deeply impressed by a strange occurrence in which bingo took a leading part there were but two of us now living on the de winton farm one morning my brother set out for boggy creek for a load of hay it was a long day's journey there and back and he made an early start strange to tell bingo for once in his life did not follow the team my brother called to him but still he stood at a safe distance and eyeing the team askance refused to stir suddenly he raised his nose in the air and gave vent to a long melancholy howl he watched the wagon out of sight and even followed for a hundred yards or so raising his voice from time to time in the most doleful howlings all that day he stayed about the barn the only time that he was willingly separated from the horses and at intervals howled a very death dirge i was alone and the dog's behaviour inspired me with an awful foreboding of calamity that weighed upon us more and more as the hours passed away about six o'clock bingo's howlings became unbearable so that for lack of a better thought i threw something at him and ordered him away but oh the feeling of horror that filled me why did i let my brother go away alone should i ever again see him alive i might have known from the dog's actions that something dreadful was about to happen at length the hour for his return arrived and there was john on his load i took charge of the horses vastly relieved and with an air of assumed unconcern asked all right right was the laconic answer who now can say that there is nothing in omens and yet when long afterward i told this to one skilled in the occult he looked grave and said bingo always turned to you in a crisis yes then do not smile it was you that were in danger that day he stayed and saved your life though you never knew from what four early in the spring i had begun bingo's education very shortly afterward he began mine midway on the two-mile stretch of prairie that lay between our shanty and the village of carbury was the corner stake of the farm it was a stout post in a low mound of earth and was visible from afar i soon noticed that bingo never passed without minutely examining this mysterious post next i learned that it was also visited by the prairie wolves as well as by all the dogs in the neighborhood and at length with the aid of a telescope i made a number of observations that helped me to an understanding of the matter and enabled me to enter more fully into bingo's private life 
the post was by common agreement a registry of the canine tribes their exquisite sense of smell enabled each individual to tell at once by the track and trace what other had recently been at the post when the snow came much more was revealed i then discovered that this post was but one of a system that covered the country that in short the entire region was laid out in signal stations at convenient intervals these were marked by any conspicuous post stone buffalo skull or other object that chanced to be in the desired locality and extensive observation showed that it was a very complete system for getting and giving the news each dog or wolf makes a point of calling at those stations that are near his line of travel to learn who has recently been there just as a man calls at his club on returning to town and looks up the register i have seen bingo approach the post sniff examine the ground about then growl and with bristling mane and glowing eyes scratch fiercely and contemptuously with his hind feet finally walking off very stiffly glancing back from time to time all of which being interpreted said Grr, wolf there's that dirty cur of mccarthy's wolf i'll tend to him to-night wolf wolf on another occasion after the preliminaries he became keenly interested and studied a coyote's track that came and went saying to himself as i afterward learned a coyote track coming from the north smelling of dead cow indeed bolsworth old brindle must be dead at last this is worth looking into at other times he would wag his tail trot about the vicinity and come again and again to make his own visit more evident perhaps for the benefit of his brother bill just back from brandon so that it was not by chance that one night bill turned up at bingo's home and was taken to the hills where a delicious dead horse afforded a chance to suitably celebrate the reunion at other times he would be suddenly aroused by the news take up the trail and race to the next station for later information sometimes his inspection produced only an air of grave attention as though he said to himself dear me who the deuce is this or it seems to me i met that fellow at the portage last summer one morning on approaching the post bingo's every hair stood on end his tail dropped and quivered and he gave proof that he was suddenly sick at the stomach sure signs of terror he showed no desire to follow up or no more of the matter but returned to the house and half an hour afterward his mane was still bristling and his expression one of hate or fear i studied the dreaded track and learned that in bingo's language the half terrified half gurgled gruff means timber wolf these were among the things that bingo taught me and in the aftertime when i might chance to see him aroused from his frosty nest by the stable door and after stretching himself and shaking the snow from his shaggy coat disappear into the gloom at a steady trot 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 i used to think ah old dog i know where you're off to and why you eschew the shelter of the shanty now i know why your nightly trips over the country are so well timed and how you know just where to go for what you want and when and how to seek it five in the autumn of eighteen eighty four the shanty at de winton farm was closed and bingo changed his home to the establishment that is to the stable not the house of gordon wright our most intimate neighbor since the winter of his puppyhood he had declined to enter a house at any time excepting during a thunderstorm of thunder and guns he had a deep dread no doubt the fear of the first originated in the second and that arose from some unpleasant shotgun experiences the cause of which will be seen his nightly couch was outside the stable even during the coldest weather and it was easy to see he enjoyed to the full the complete nocturnal liberty entailed bingo's midnight wanderings extended across the plains for miles there was plenty of proof of this some farmers at very remote points sent word to old gordon that if he did not keep his dog home nights they would use the shotgun 
and bingo's terror of firearms would indicate that the threats were not idle a man living as far away as petrel said he saw a large black wolf kill a coyote on the snow one winter evening but afterward he changed his opinion and reckoned it must have been wright's dog whenever the body of a winter killed ox or horse was exposed bingo was sure to repair to it nightly and driving away the prairie wolves feast to repletion sometimes the object of a nightly foray was merely to maul some distant neighbor's dog and notwithstanding vengeful threats there seemed no reason to fear that the bingo breed would die out one man even avowed that he had seen a prairie wolf accompanied by three young ones which resembled the mother excepting that they were very large and black and had a ring of white around the muzzle true or not as that may be i know that late in march while we were out in the sleigh with bingo trotting behind a prairie wolf was starting from a hollow away it went with bingo in full chase but the wolf did not greatly exert itself to escape and within a short distance bingo was close up yet strange to tell there was no grappling no fight bingo trotted amiably alongside and licked the wolf's nose we were astounded and shouted to urge bingo on our shouting and approach several times started the wolf off at speed and bingo again pursued until he had overtaken it but his gentleness was too obvious oh it is a she-wolf he won't harm her i exclaimed as the truth dawned on me and gordon said well i'll be darned so we called our unwilling dog and drove on for weeks after this we were annoyed by the depredations of a prairie wolf who killed our chickens stole pieces of pork from the end of the house and several times terrified the children by looking into the window of the shanty while the men were away against this animal bingo seemed to be no safeguard at length the wolf a female was killed and then bingo plainly showed his hand by his lasting enmity toward oliver the man who did the deed six it is wonderful and beautiful how a man and his dog will stick to one another through thick and thin butler tells of an undivided indian tribe in the far north which was all but exterminated by an internecine war over a dog that belonged to one man and was killed by his neighbor and among ourselves we have lawsuits fights and deadly feuds all pointing the same old moral love me love my dog one of our neighbors had a very fine hound that he thought the best and dearest dog in the world i loved him so i loved his dog and when one day poor tan crawled home terribly mangled and died by the door i joined my threats of vengeance with those of his master and thenceforth lost no opportunity of tracing the miscreant both by offering rewards and by collecting scraps of evidence at length it was clear that one of three men to the southard had had a hand in the cruel affair the scent was warming up and soon we should have been in a position to exact rigorous justice at least from the wretch who had murdered poor old tan then something took place which at once changed my mind and led me to believe that the mangling of the old hound was not by any means an unpardonable crime but indeed on second thoughts was rather commendable than otherwise gordon wright's farm lay to the south of us and while there one day gordon jr knowing that i was tracking the murderer took me aside and looking about furtively he whispered in tragic tones it was bang done it and the matter dropped right there for i confess that from that moment i did all in my power to baffle the justice i had previously striven so hard to further i had given bingo away long before but the feeling of ownership did not die and of this indissoluble fellowship of dog and man he was soon to take part in another important illustration old gordon and oliver were close neighbors and friends they joined in a contract to cut wood and worked together harmoniously till late on in winter then oliver's old horse died and he determining to profit as far as possible dragged it out on the plain and laid poison baits for wolves around it 
alas for poor bingo he would lead a wolfish life though again and again it brought him into wolfish misfortunes he was as fond of dead horse as any of his wild kindred that very night with wright's own dog curly he visited the carcass it seemed as though bing had busied himself chiefly keeping off the wolves but curly feasted immoderately the tracks in the snow told the story of the banquet the interruption as the poison began to work and of the dreadful spasms of pain during the erratic course back home where curly falling in convulsions at gordon's feet died in the greatest agony love me love my dog no explanations or apology were acceptable it was useless to urge that it was accidental the long-standing feud between bingo and oliver was now remembered as an important sidelight the wood contract was thrown up all friendly relations ceased and to this day there is no county big enough to hold the rival factions which were called at once into existence and to arms by curly's dying yell it was months before bingo really recovered from the poison we believed indeed that he never again would be the sturdy old-time bingo but when the spring came he began to gain strength and bettering as the grass grew he was within a few weeks once more in full health and vigour to be a pride to his friends and a nuisance to his neighbours seven changes took me far away from manitoba and on my return in eighteen eighty six bingo was still a member of wright's household i thought he would have forgotten me after two years absence but not so one day early in the winter after having been lost for forty-eight hours he crawled home to wright's with a wolf trap and a heavy log fastened to one foot and the foot frozen to stony hardness no one had been able to approach to help him he was so savage when i the stranger now stooped down and laid hold of the trap with one hand and his leg with the other instantly he seized my wrist in his teeth without stirring i said bing don't you know me he had not broken the skin and at once released his hold and offered no further resistance although he whined a good deal during the removal of the trap he still acknowledged me his master in spite of his change of residence and my long absence and notwithstanding my surrender of ownership i still felt that he was my dog bing was carried into the house much against his will and his frozen foot thawed out during the rest of the winter he went lame and two of his toes eventually dropped off but before the return of warm weather his health and strength were fully restored and to a casual glance he bore no mark of his dreadful experience in the steel trap eight during that same winter i caught many wolves and foxes who did not have bingo's good luck in escaping the traps which i kept outright into the spring for bounties are good even when fur is not kennedy's plain was always a good trapping ground because it was unfrequented by man and yet lay between the heavy woods and the settlement i had been fortunate with the fur here and late in april rode in on one of my regular rounds the wolf traps were made of heavy steel and have two springs each of one hundred pounds power they are set in fours around a buried bait and after being strongly fastened to concealed logs are carefully covered in cotton and in fine sand so as to be quite invisible a prairie wolf was caught in one of these i killed him with a club and throwing him aside proceeded to reset the trap as i had done so many hundred times before all was quickly done i threw the trap wrench over toward the pony and seeing some fine sand near by i reached out for a handful of it to add a good finish to the setting o oh, unlucky thought o oh, mad heedlessness born of long immunity that fine sand was on the next wolf trap and in an instant i was a prisoner although not wounded for the traps have no teeth and my thick trapping gloves deadened the snap i was firmly caught across the hand above the knuckles not greatly alarmed at this i tried to reach the trap wrench with my right foot stretching out at full length face downward i worked myself toward it 
making my imprisoned arm as long and straight as possible i could not see and reach at the same time but counted on my toe telling me when i touched the little iron key to my fetters my first effort was a failure strain as i might at the chain my toe struck no metal i swung slowly around my anchor but still failed then a painfully taken observation showed i was much too far to the west i set about working around tapping blindly with my toe to discover the key thus wildly groping with my right foot i forgot about the other till there was a sharp clank and the iron jaws of trap number five closed tight on my left foot the terrors of the situation did not at first impress me but i soon found that all my struggles were in vain i could not get free from either trap or move the traps together and there i lay stretched out and firmly staked to the ground what would become of me now there was not much danger of freezing for the cold weather was over but kennedy's plain was never visited by the winter woodcutters no one knew where i had gone and unless i could manage to free myself there was no prospect ahead but to be devoured by wolves or else die of cold and starvation as i lay there the red sun went down over the spruce swamp west of the plain and a shore lark on a gopher mound a few yards off twittered his evening song just as one had done the night before at our shanty door and though the numb pains were creeping up my arm and a deadly chill possessed me i noticed how long his little ear tufts were then my thoughts went to the comfortable supper-table at wright's shanty and i thought now they were frying the pork for supper or just sitting down my pony stood still as i left him with his bridle on the ground patiently waiting to take me home he did not understand the long delay and when i called he ceased nibbling the grass and looked at me in dumb helpless inquiry if he would only go home the empty saddle might tell the tale and bring help but his very faithfulness kept him waiting hour after hour while i was perishing of cold and hunger then i remembered how old giroux the trapper had been lost and in the following spring his comrades found his skeleton held by the leg in a bear trap i wondered which part of my clothing would show my identity then a new thought came to me this is how a wolf feels when he is trapped oh what misery have i been responsible for now i'm to pay for it night came slowly on a prairie wolf howled the pony pricked up his ears and walking nearer to me stood with his head down then another prairie wolf howled and another and i could make out that they were gathering in the neighbourhood there i lay prone and helpless wondering if it would not be strictly just that they should come and tear me to pieces i heard them calling for a long time before i realized that dim shadowy forms were sneaking near the horse saw them first and his terrified snort drove them back at first but they came nearer next time and sat around me on the prairie soon one bolder than the others crawled up and tugged at the body of his dead relative i shouted and he retreated growling the pony ran to a distance in terror presently the wolf returned and after two or three of these retreats and returns the body was dragged off and devoured by the rest in a few minutes after this they gathered nearer and sat on their haunches to look at me and the boldest one smelt the rifle and scratched dirt on it he retreated when i kicked at him with my free boot and shouted but growing bolder as i grew weaker he came and snarled right in my face at this several others snarled and came up closer and i realized that i was to be devoured by the foe that i most despised when suddenly out of the gloom with a guttural roar sprang a great black wolf the prairie wolves scattered like chaff except the bold one which seized by the black newcomer was in a few moments a draggled corpse and then oh horrors this mighty brute bounded at me and bingo noble bingo rubbing his shaggy panting sides against me and licked my cold face bing bing oh boy Fe fetch me the trap wrench 
Away he went, and returned dragging the rifle, for he knew only that I wanted something. No, Bing, the trap wrench. This time it was my sash, but at last he brought the wrench, and wagged his tail in joy that it was right. Reaching out my free hand, after much difficulty, I unscrewed the pillar nut. The trap fell apart, and my hand was released, and a minute later I was free. Bing brought the pony up, and after slowly walking to restore the circulation, I was able to mount. Then slowly at first, but soon at a gallop, with Bingo as herald, careering and barking ahead, we set out for home, there to learn that the night before, though never taken on the trapping rounds, the brave dog had acted strangely, whimpering and watching the timber trail, and at last, when night came on, in spite of attempts to detain him, he had set out in the gloom, and guided by a knowledge that is beyond us, had reached the spot in time to avenge me, as well as set me free. Staunch old Bing, he was a strange dog. Though his heart was with me, he passed me next day with scarcely a look, but responded with alacrity when little Gordon called him to a gopher hunt. And it was so to the end and to the end also he lived the wolfish life that he loved and never failed to seek the winter killed horses and found one again with a poisoned bait and wolfishly bolted that then feeling the pang set out not for rights but to find me and reached the door of my shanty where i should have been next day on returning i found him dead in the snow with his head on the sill of the door the door of his puppyhood's days my dog to the last in his heart of hearts it was my help he sought and vainly sought in the hour of his bitter extremity and of story nine story ten woolly the story of a yaller dog by ernest thompson seaton woolly was a little yaller dog a yaller dog be it understood is not necessarily the same as a yellow dog he is not simply a canine whose capillary covering is highly charged with yellow pigment he is the mongrelest mixture of all mongrels the least common multiple of all dogs the breedless union of all breeds and though of no breed at all he is yet of older better breed than any of his aristocratic relations for he is nature's attempt to restore the ancestral jackal the parent stock of all dogs indeed the scientific name of the jackal canis aureus means simply yellow dog and not a few of that animal's characteristics are seen in his domesticated representative for the plebeian cur is shrewd active and hardy and far better equipped for the real struggle of life than any of his thoroughbred kinsmen if we were to abandon a yaller dog a greyhound and a bulldog on a desert island which of them after six months would be alive and well unquestionably it would be the despised yellow cur he has not the speed of the greyhound but neither does he bear the seeds of lung and skin disease he has not the strength or reckless courage of the bulldog but he has something a thousand times better he has common sense health and wit are no mean equipment for the life struggle and when the dog world is not managed by man they have never yet failed to bring out the yellow mongrel as the sole and triumphant survivor once in a while the reversion to the jackal type is more complete and the yaller dog has pricked and pointed ears beware of him then he is cunning and plucky and can bite like a wolf there is a strange wild streak in his nature too that under cruelty or long adversity may develop into deadliest treachery in spite of the better traits that are the foundation of man's love for the dog one away up in the cheviot little woolly was born he and one other of the litter were kept his brother because he resembled the best dog in the vicinity and himself because he was a little yellow beauty his early life was that of a sheepdog, in company with an experienced collie who trained him, and an old shepherd who was scarcely inferior to them in intelligence. By the time he was two years old, Woolly was full-grown, and had taken a thorough course in sheep. 
he knew them from ram horn to lamb hoof an old robin his master at length had such confidence in his sagacity that he would frequently stay at the tavern all night while woolly guarded the woolly idiots in the hills his education had been wisely bestowed and in most ways he was a very bright little dog with a future before him yet he never learned to despise that addle-pated robin the old shepherd with all his faults his continual striving after his ideal state intoxication and his mind shrivelling life in general was rarely brutal to woolly and woolly repaid him with an exaggerated worship that the greatest and wisest in the land would have aspired to in vain woolly would not have imagined any greater being than robin and yet for the sum of five shillings a week all robin's vital energy and mental force were pledged to the service of a not very great cattle and sheep dealer the real proprietor of woolly's charge and when this man really less great than the neighbouring laird ordered robin to drive his flock by stages to the yorkshire moors and markets of all the three hundred and seventy-six mentalities concerned woolly's was the most interested and interesting the journey through northumberland was uneventful at the river tyne the sheep were driven on to the ferry and landed safely in smoky south shields the great factory chimneys were just starting up for the day and belching out fog banks and thunder rollers of opaque leaden smoke that darkened the air and hung low like a storm cloud over the streets the sheep thought that they recognized the fuming dun of an unusually heavy cheviot storm they became alarmed and in spite of their keepers stampeded through the town in three hundred and seventy four different directions robin was vexed to the inmost recesses of his tiny soul he stared stupidly after the sheep for half a minute then gave the order woolly fetch them in after this mental effort he sat down lit his pipe and taking out his knitting began work on a half-finished sock to woolly the voice of robin was the voice of god away he ran in three hundred and seventy-four different directions and headed off and rounded up the three hundred and seventy-four different wanderers and brought them back to the ferry house before robin who was stolidly watching the process had towed off his sock finally woolly not robin gave the sign that all were in the old shepherd proceeded to count them three seventy three seventy one three seventy two three seventy three woolly he said reproachfully there's nor a here there's a nither and woolly stung with shame bounded off to scour the whole city for the missing one he was not long gone when a small boy pointed out to robin that the sheep were all there the whole three hundred and seventy-four now robin was in a quandary his order was to hasten on to yorkshire and yet he knew that woolly's pride would prevent his coming back without another sheep even if he had to steal it such things had happened before and resulted in embarrassing complications what should he do there was five shillings a week at stake woolly was a good dog it was a pity to lose him but then his orders from the master and again if woolly stole an extra sheep to make up the number then what in a foreign land too he decided to abandon woolly and push on alone with the sheep and how he fared no one knows or cares meanwhile woolly careered through miles of streets hunting in vain for his lost sheep all day he searched and at night famished and worn out he sneaked shamefacedly back to the ferry only to find that master and sheep had gone his sorrow was pitiful to see he ran about whimpering then took the ferry boat across to the other side and searched everywhere for robin he returned to south shields and searched there and spent the rest of the night seeking for his wretched idol the next day he continued his search he crossed and recrossed the river many times he watched and smelt every one that came over and with significant shrewdness he sought unceasingly in the neighbouring taverns for his master the next day he set to work systematically to smell every one that might cross the ferry 
the ferry makes fifty trips a day with an average of one hundred persons a trip yet never once did woolly fail to be on the gangplank and smell every pair of legs that crossed five thousand pairs ten thousand legs that day did woolly examine after his own fashion and the next day and the next and all the week he kept his post and seemed indifferent to feeding himself soon starvation and worry began to tell on him he grew thin and ill-tempered no one could touch him and any attempt to interfere with his daily occupation of leg smelling roused him to desperation day after day week after week woolly watched and waited for his master who never came the ferrymen learned to respect woolly's fidelity at first he scorned their proffered food and shelter and lived no one knew how but starved to it at last he accepted the gifts and learned to tolerate the givers although embittered against the world his heart was true to his worthless master fourteen months afterward i made his acquaintance he was still on rigid duty at his post he had regained his good looks his bright keen face set off by his white ruff and pricked ears made a dog to catch the eye anywhere but he gave me no second glance once he found my legs were not those he sought and in spite of my friendly overtures during the ten months following that he continued his watch i got no farther along his confidence than any other stranger for two whole years did this devoted creature attend that ferry there was only one thing to prevent him going home to the hills not the distance nor the chance of getting lost but the conviction that robin the godlike robin wished him to stay by the ferry and he stayed but he crossed the water as often as he felt it would serve his purpose the fare for a dog was one penny and it was calculated that woolly owed the company hundreds of pounds before he gave up his quest he never failed to sense every pair of nethers that crossed the gangplank six million legs by computation had been pronounced upon by this expert but all to no purpose his unswerving fidelity never faltered though his temper was obviously souring under the long strain we had never heard what became of robin but one day a sturdy drover strode down the ferry slip and woolly mechanically assaying the new personality suddenly started his mane bristled he trembled a low growl escaped him and he fixed his every sense on the drover one of the fairy hands not understanding called to the stranger oop man ye man has hurt our dog where you hurtin him ye fool he is mare like to hurt me but further explanation was not necessary woolly's manner had wholly changed he fawned on the drover and his tail was wagging violently for the first time in years a few words made it all clear dorley the driver had known robin very well and the mittens and comforter he wore were of robin's own make and had once been part of his wardrobe woolly recognized the traces of his master and despairing of any nearer approach to his lost idol he abandoned his post at the ferry and plainly announced his intention of sticking to the owner of the mittens and dorley was well pleased to take woolly along to his home among the hills of derbyshire where he became once more a sheep-dog in charge of a flock two monsadale is one of the best-known valleys in derbyshire the pig and whistle is its single but celebrated inn and joe greatorex the landlord is a shrewd and sturdy yorkshireman nature meant him for a frontiersman but circumstances made him an innkeeper and his inborn tastes made him a well never mind there was a great deal of poaching done in that country woolly's new home was on the upland east of the valley above joe's inn and that fact was not without weight in bringing me to monsdale his master dorley farmed in a small way on the lowland and on the moors had a large number of sheep these woolly guarded with his old-time sagacity watching them while they fed and bringing them to the fold at night 
He was reserved and preoccupied for a dog, and rather too ready to show his teeth to strangers, but he was so unremitting in his attention to his flock that Dorley did not lose a lamb that year, although the neighboring farmers paid the usual tribute to eagles and to foxes. The Dales are poor fox-hunting country at best. The rocky ridges, high stone walls, and precipices are too numerous to please the riders, and the final retreats in the rocks are so plentiful that it was a marvel the foxes did not overrun Monsdale. But they didn't. There had been but little reason for complaint until the year 1881, when a sly old fox quartered himself on the fat parish like a mouse inside a cheese, and laughed equally at the hounds of the huntsmen and the lurchers of the farmers. He was several times run by the peak hounds, and escaped by making for the devil's hole. Once in this gorge, where the cracks in the rocks extend unknown distances, he was safe. The country folk began to see something more than chance in the fact that he always escaped at the devil's hole, and when one of the hounds, who nearly caught this devil's fox, soon after went mad, it removed all doubt as to the spiritual paternity of the said fox. He continued his career of rapine, making audacious raids and hairbreadth escapes, and finally began, as do many old foxes, to kill from a mania for slaughter. Thus it was that Digby lost ten lambs in one night. Carroll lost seven the next night. Later, the vicarage duck pond was wholly devastated, and scarcely a night passed but someone in the region had to report a carnage of poultry, lambs, or sheep, and finally even calves. Of course, all the slaughter was attributed to this one fox of the devil's hole. It was known only that he was a very large fox, at least one that made a very large track. He never was clearly seen, even by the huntsman, and it was noticed that Thunder and Bell, the staunchest hounds in the pack, had refused to tongue or even to follow the trail when he was hunted. His reputation for madness sufficed to make the master of the peak hounds avoid the neighborhood. The farmers in Monsdale, led by Joe, agreed among themselves that if it would only come on a snow, they would assemble and beat the whole country, and in defiance of all rules of the hunt, get rid of the daft fox in any way they could. But the snow did not come, and the red-haired gentleman lived his life. Notwithstanding his madness, he did not lack method. He never came two successive nights to the same farm. He never ate where he killed, and he never left a track that betrayed his retreat. He usually finished up his night's trail on the turf or on a public highway. Once I saw him. I was walking to Monsdale from Bakewell late one night during a heavy storm, and as I turned the corner of Stead's sheepfold, there was a vivid flash of lightning. By its light there was fixed on my retina a picture that made me start. Sitting on his haunches by the roadside twenty yards away was a very large fox gazing at me with malignant eyes and licking his muzzle in a suggestive manner. All this I saw, but no more, and might have forgotten it or thought myself mistaken, but the next morning in that very fold were found the bodies of twenty-three lambs and sheep and the unmistakable signs that brought home the crime to the well-known marauder. There was only one man who escaped, and that was Dorley. This was the more remarkable, because he lived in the center of the region raided, and within one mile of the Devil's Hole. Faithful Woolly proved himself worth all the dogs in the neighborhood. Night after night he brought in the sheep, and never one was missing. The mad fox might prowl about the Dorley homestead if he wished, but Woolly, shrewd, brave, active Woolly, was more than a match for him and not only saved his master's flock, but himself escaped with a whole skin. Everyone entertained a profound respect for him, and he might have been a popular pet, but for his temper, which, never genial, became more and more crabbed. He seemed to like Dorley, and Holda, Dorley's eldest daughter, a shrewd, handsome young woman, who, in the capacity of general manager of the house, was Willie's special guardian. The other members of Dorley's family Woolley learned to tolerate, but the rest of the world, men and dogs, 
he seemed to hate. His uncanny disposition was well known in the last meeting I had with him. I was walking on a pathway across the moor behind Dorley's house. Woolley was lying on the doorstep. As I drew near, he arose, and without appearing to see me, trotted toward my pathway, and placed himself across it about ten yards ahead of me. There he stood, silently and intently regarding the distant moor, his slightly bristling mane the only sign that he had not been suddenly turned to stone. He did not stir as I came up, and, not wishing to quarrel, I stepped around past his nose and walked on. Woolley at once left his position, and in the same eerie silence trotted on some twenty feet, and again stood across the pathway. Once more I came up, and, stepping into the grass, brushed past his nose. Instantly, but without a sound, he seized my left heel. I kicked out with the other foot, but he escaped. Not having a stick, I flung a large stone at him. He leaped forward, and the stone struck him in the ham, bowling him over into a ditch. He gasped out a savage growl as he fell, but scrambled out of the ditch and limped away in silence. Yet solemn and ferocious as Willie was to the world, he was always gentle with Dorley's sheep. Many were the tales of rescues told of him. Many a poor lamb that had fallen into a pond or hole would have perished but for his timely and sagacious aid. Many a far weltered you did he turn right side up, while his keen eye discerned and his fierce courage baffled every eagle that had appeared on the moor in his time. 3. The Monsdale farmers were still paying their nightly tribute to the mad fox when the snow came late in December. Poor Widow Cot lost her entire flock of twenty sheep, and the fiery cross went forth early in the morning. With guns unconcealed, the burly farmer set out to follow to the finish the tell-tale tracks in the snow, those of a very large fox, undoubtedly the multo murderous villain. For a while the trail was clear enough, then it came to the river, and the habitual cunning of the animal was shown. He reached the water at a long angle, pointing downstream, and jumped into the shallow, unfrozen current but at the other side there was no track leading out, and it was only after long searching that a quarter of a mile higher up the stream they found where he had come out. The track then ran to the top of Henley's high stone wall, where there was no snow left to tell tales, but the patient hunters persevered. When it crossed the smooth snow from the wall to the high road, there was a difference of opinion. Some claimed that the track went up, others down the road. But Joe settled it, and after another long search they found where apparently the same trail, though some said a larger one, had left the road to enter a sheepfold, and leaving this without harming the occupants, the trail maker had stepped in the footmarks of a countryman, thereby getting to the moor road along which he had trotted straight to Dorley's farm. That day the sheep were kept in on account of the snow, and Woolley, without his usual occupation, was lying on some planks in the sun. As the hunters drew near the house, he growled savagely and sneaked around to where the sheep were. Joe Gretorix walked up to where Woolley had crossed the fresh snow, gave a glance, looked dumbfounded, then pointing to the retreating sheepdog, he said with emphasis, "'Lads, we're off the track of the fox, but there's the killer of the widder's voos.' Some agreed with Joe, others recalled the doubt in the trail, and were for going back to make a fresh follow. At this juncture, Dorley himself came out of the house. "'Tom,' said Joe, "'that dog of thine has killed twenty a widder gold sheep last night, and for one don't believe it's his first killin.' Why, I'm on thou, thou art crazy, said Tom. I never had a better sheep dog. A fair loves the sheep. I wish sent some out of that in last night's work, replied Joe. In vain the company related the history of the morning. Tom swore that it was nothing but a jealous conspiracy to rob him of Woolley. Woolley sleeps at a kitchen every night. Never is oot till he's let out by the woos. Why, mon, he is whip er sheep the year round, and never a hoof had a lost. 
tom became much excited over this abominable attempt against woolly's reputation and life joe and his partisans got equally angry and it was a wise suggestion of holda's that quieted them father said she i'll sleep in the kitchen the night if woolly is away or gettin out i'll see to it and if he's no oot and sheep's killed on the countryside we'll have proof it's na woolly that night holda stretched herself on the settee and woolly slept as usual underneath the table as night wore on the dog became restless he turned on his bed and once or twice got up stretched looked at holda and lay down again about two o'clock he seemed no longer able to resist some strange impulse he rose quietly looked toward the low window then at the motionless girl Hulda lay still and breathed as though sleeping woolly slowly came near and sniffed and breathed his doggy breath in her face she made no move he nudged her gently with his nose then with his sharp ears forward and his head on one side he studied her calm face. Still no sign. He walked quietly to the window, mounted the table without noise, placed his nose under the sash bar, and raised the light frame until he could put one paw underneath. Then, changing, he put his nose under the sash and raised it high enough to slip out, easing down the frame finally on his rump and tail with an adroitness that told of long practice then he disappeared into the darkness from her couch holda watched in amazement after waiting for some time to make sure that he was gone she arose intending to call her father at once but on second thought she decided to await more conclusive proof she peered into the darkness but no sign of woolly was to be seen she put more wood on the fire and lay down again for over an hour she lay wide awake listening to the kitchen clock and starting at each trifling sound and wondering what the dog was doing could it be possible that he had really killed the widow's sheep then the recollection of his gentleness to their own sheep came and completed her perplexity another hour slowly tick-tocked she heard a slight sound at the window that made her heart jump the scratching sound was soon followed by the lifting of the sash and in a short time woolly was back in the kitchen with the window closed behind him by the flickering firelight hulda could see a strange wild gleam in his eye and his jaws and snowy breast were dashed with fresh blood the dog ceased his slight panting as he scrutinized the girl then as she did not move he lay down and began to lick his paws and muzzle growling lowly once or twice as though at the remembrance of some recent occurrence hulda had seen enough there could be no longer any doubt that joe was right and more a new thought flashed into her quick brain she realized that the weird fox of mansell was before her raising herself she looked straight at woolly and exclaimed woolly woolly so it's true oh woolly a terrible brute her voice was fiercely reproachful it rang in the quiet kitchen and woolly recoiled as though shot he gave a desperate glance toward the closed window his eye gleamed and his mane bristled but he cowered under her gaze and groveled on the floor as though begging for mercy slowly he crawled nearer and nearer as if to lick her feet until quite close then with the fury of a tiger but without a sound he sprang for her throat the girl was taken unawares but she threw up her arm in time and woolly's long gleaming tusks sank into her flesh and grated on the bone help help father father she shrieked woolly was a light weight and for a moment she flung him off but there could be no mistaking his purpose the game was up it was his life or hers now father father she screamed as the yellow fury striving to kill her bit and tore the unprotected hands that had so often fed him in vain she fought to hold him off he would soon have had her by the throat when in rushed dorley straight at him now in the same horrid silence sprang woolly and savagely tore him again and again before a deadly blow from the faggot hook disabled him dashing him gasping and writhing on the stone floor desperate and done for but game and defiant to the last 
another quick blow scattered his brains on the hearthstone where so long he had been a faithful and honored retainer and woolly bright fierce trusty treacherous woolly quivered a moment then straightened out and lay forever still end of story ten end of dog a selection of stories by various authors